A uh, very good morning uh, to all of you. And thank you for coming to this third day of the workshop. I would like to appreciate, especially those who have been with us for the last two days, this being our last day, we would like to focus on uh, reforming the public transport operators. We would like to listen to a few cases as I promised yesterday. And uh, the program will begin with the ITDP's presentation on uh, integrating the public transport operators and the business models. And then we'll move on. Uh, Dixon, my friend, I think I saw you on this call. We'll have you after Engineer Jerry so that we combine your voice with what we'll have heard from the engineer. And then we'll pick it up from there. Uh, it's been very interesting to engage on the chat. I encourage us to continue doing that. I also have enjoyed the interventions of a few key people. Yesterday we had Honorable Mary Muami from Nairobi Metropolitan Services. Uh, we hope that we have more people today from the institutions of Kura, Kenha, NMS, uh, Ministry of Lands and the planners, because this indeed is a session that is supposed to consolidate what Nairobi Metropolitan is doing, not just through NAMATA, but through the interagency coordination. So uh, we are still waiting for confirmation regarding the NAMATA presentation. We'll keep you updated. Uh, we want to thank you again for your active participation and so that we manage the time. I want us uh, to go right in. Yesterday we had very exciting presentations on the simulations for BRT planning. Gabriel and Remy took us through the technical bits and warned us that it is good to get the design right. You may paint different scenarios, but as you pick up on the current demand, you need to also watch out for future demand. That's what I picked from their presentation. Things about accuracy, getting it right, uh, connecting it with the rest of the city, feeder routes, all of that was brought out very clearly. And then we had uh, Egypt, a very, very clear, concise, presentation, bringing the various elements of BRT, telling us what it is that they did and how they brought the institutions together. To me, a very good example of how an NGO can help bring in all the actors in government. And yet, as we know it, ITDP is not the one running the BRT project in Egypt. There is an owner. We were told that they are forming a public transport agency within which the BRT agency will fall. The Ministry of Housing is the one that's uh, taking charge of this whole project, but the Ministry of Transport and other government agencies are coming together to make sure that the whole wheel is moving smoothly. So for me, that was a very good example of uh, a proper BRT planning process. And we do look forward to what Egypt will present to us. We were told that by 2024, if you visit Egypt, you'll be able to get a working BRT system. So that was very inspiring. I hope you are also inspired. And I hope that the engineers and planners from Nairobi, because this workshop is truly yours, we've just invited other people from the globe to help us appreciate some of the opportunities that we have to make a good BRT scheme. Of course, uh, for the Namata slot, I want to thank planner James Minor, who we should be listening to later on. He took on a lot of the questions around Namata. And we appreciate that he was able to say, yes, government is working well, it's working hard, but we are struggling because this is a pilot project. A lot of things may be falling in place, but we are doing it in bits and pieces. That's what I understood engineer, I mean, planner minor to be saying that on the one side, they are working with the operators, 
They are also working with the design consultant who is constructing, and that even for Namata, never mind, we may not have understood the planning process very clearly. They hope to launch a pilot BRT on Thika Road next year. And there was a lot of uh, expression from participants, can we have some communication no matter? Don't wait until the thing is complete. Kindly tell us what is happening in the interim. Uh, let there be some public participation, if for nothing else, so that the public begins to change their attitude uh, based on what was communicated earlier on when the red line was painted. So that was an appeal that was made. I may not summarize every little bit about yesterday, uh, but I just want to excite you that today we do have a number of presentations. ITDP will set the stage on the framework for planning for public transport operators. And then later on, the TDM, uh, the TOD, sorry, that includes TDM, of course. And then we'll have the Kigali experience shared with us. Uh, hopefully the die experience as well. And at the end of it, we'd like to ask ourselves a question. So what do we need to get it right for Nairobi based on all the sharing across the globe? So do welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're uh, logging in from. And uh, without talking too much, as I grow older, I realize I can talk a lot. I'd like to encourage us to switch off our videos so that we have an efficient transmission unless you're presenting. Mute your mic and we give this floor to engineer Jerry Mboru. Thank you and Karibu. Uh, thank you very much Rehab. Uh, I want to get my presentation on board. Uh, just one minute. I'm trying to get a uh, full screen and I don't know why it's not coming. Uh, good morning, everybody. Morning, engineer. Can you see my screen? I'm not able to get a full screen. Well, I doubt if you go to slideshow. At, at the bottom, bottom right is there a slideshow. Uh, let me try that again. Okay. I'm there. You are yes, able to see thank you. my yes. screen? Yes, yes, we are. Karibu. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Rehab. Uh, and my name is uh, Jerry Boro, and I'm working with ITDP Kenya. I'm the country manager based in Nairobi. Yeah, so I'll be discussing about uh, the public transport reforms. And uh, we can start with the current status, looking at the situation at the moment. We find that uh, we have the Matatus, like in the Kenyan situation, who are providing very important and essential service to the uh, citizens. There is minimum government involvement. And in fact, Ijinia Gitao confirmed it. Government is absent in public transport. And we find that all risk is allocated to the private sector. And this results in a number of challenges. 
One, we have dominance of rent-seeking cartels in the industry. We have police demanding bribes. And we have also old fleet, inadequate maintenance, and pollution. And this pollution is affecting the passengers, it's affecting the crew, it's affecting the pedestrian, it's affecting uh, the urban space. And also there is the issue of the low wait, 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 wait. there is the issue of the low service levels. The routes and the schedules are based on profits often and not the passenger convenience. And also there is low uh, system efficiency and poor customer service. You can see that photo. It's taken in Kisumu and you can see the, the walking environment. Uh, there is no passenger shelter. Yeah, this is a common uh, uh, site around uh, most African cities. And then there are also the labor issues. The crew are working for very long hours. The drivers are compensated on target system. And they end up, because uh, this target system requires uh, that they give a certain amount to the vehicle owners. They want to speed up and uh, make as many trips as possible. Thus, this results in uh, uh, frequent crashes. So they, there's the road safety issue there. And then also they do not have benefits. They are not medical, there is no maternity, there is no annual leave. And poor working conditions, especially for women. You'll find that, uh, for example, something basic, as basic as toilet facilities are missing. And this is the kind of situation that you find on the ground. So there are crashes, and often these crashes result in fatalities for pedestrians. And also we find that uh, most of the times the vehicles are queuing on the road, so they contribute to the traffic congestion. And passengers have to queue on the street where they are exposed to weather elements. So uh, that is the, the current situation. How do we move from here? How do we regulate the public transport operations? Or rather, how does the government get to regulate the public transport operations? So one, the government must be strong. It must be firm. It must enforce standards. It must deal with cartels. Government must also deal with traffic police corruption. Government must be consistent. So this is not a time, uh, a part-time, Thing. It has to be always there because people are moving every day. And government needs to be a fair regulator. So what is the role of government in the uh, public transport sector? Government needs to provide the right infrastructure for public transport. It needs to provide the right policies and regulations it needs to set the minimum service levels. Government also needs to enforce the regulations and the standards. It is also the responsibility of the government to develop uh, the operation contract with the, uh, the, uh, the operation uh, uh, companies. And government needs to procure the operators through competitive process and support the system through subsidies. So it's going to be a journey and I believe the journey has already started. We started with a situation where individuals or collectives or companies could operate anywhere and the market was largely regulated by informal associations. We have moved to another level where we have partly government regulating, giving license only to individuals and circles or companies to operate on specific routes. And 
companies, these companies, the drivers collect all the revenue. And we need to move to the next level where there is a service contract. And a bus company has the contract with the government to provide the service. And the com that contract, we will lay out the operational standards. And the services will be either route-based or area-based or any other uh, method that the government will come up with. Uh, so these contracts, what do they need to specify? A contract, an operation contract, it needs to specify the detailed bus specifications, very important. It also needs to uh, specify the payment mode. It could be per kilometer or per passenger. How will the operating company be uh, paid? The contract will also specify on the issue of the depots. This is where the service will be based. So who will be responsible for what? Who will be paying for what in the depot? And also a detailed explanation of the quality of service and the bonuses and the penalties uh, uh, that the government will put into place if uh, the operator performs to the level required or below the level required. And there should also be a, a process, a, a specified process for uh, dispute resolution. The role of the operating company and the role of government should be very clear. And there should also be a clear explanation of the assets the government is going to provide to the company, if any, and the terms of use, maintenance, ETC. Yeah, coming to compensation to the operating companies, you can have uh, two options. You can have net cost contract, where the customer fares are collected by the bus operator, and the bus operator pays for a license from government. But government does not get to know how much money is collected, how many people are transported. Uh, the second option is the gross cost contract, where the cost customer fares are collected by a trust fund. And the trust mm -hmm. fund pays the bus operator or operators the trust fund also pays the fair collection, the, the fair collection company, the ITC, uh, ITS provider. And it also pays the management fee to itself, to the trust fund manager. And uh, the government uh, can uh, uh, pay subsidies uh, through the, the trust fund. And we can see situations where uh, this is happening. This is Bogota, where company earnings are based uh, on vehicle kilometers traveled rather than the number of passengers. And we can see that uh, before the BRT came into place, drivers used to work for very long hours, 16 hours per day, under very difficult conditions. Now, after the BRT, drivers are working for only six hours per day under improved terms of service. Government must also ensure that there is no competition on the BRT corridor. So the way to do this is uh, uh, to ensure that the re government regulates access to each corridor each corridor which is allocated to a bus provider or a number of uh, providers. Uh, the access is regulated to minimize competition. And this is, uh, will uh, reduce, uh, will uh, improve the, the, the operations. Our government also needs to facilitate an inclusive reform process so that the affected operators 
transition to the new system rather than compete with it. So the, the, the current operators need to be part of the process from the beginning to the end so that they are part of the new system rather than competing with the new system. And uh, the system, the infrastructure should be such that they are dedicated bus lanes for BRT. And government also needs to introduce widespread and popular fare collection uh, system. So how does government manage the subsidies? Because you need to control the subsidies, you need to minimize so that it's not an unbearable cost for the government. So first of all, we note that subsidies are very important in this kind of a service, the public transport service, because they help to provide higher level of service and to improve affordability for the service. And potential sources of funding, where will government get money to uh, provide the subsidies for public transport. We have the fuel levy uh, that can, uh, some of the money could be used for public transport. Parking fees, congestion fees, property taxes, and any other taxes that the government can come up with for this, uh, uh, for this purpose. But these subsidies need to be minimized. So how government needs to minimize? Government needs to know in advance how much subsidy will be needed. A good estimate, a good indication of how much subsidy will be needed to sustain uh, the service. So it's very important well in advance for government to do its calculations and be able to estimate the subsidies that will be required and provide that in the budget. Government needs also to ensure that the system is designed for efficiency. And to link operator profits to the system profits. Government may also need to increase fares if the operator costs increase significantly. Let's say, for example, if there is an increase, a significant increase in fuel cost, like uh, currently what happened recently, uh, government may need to uh, allow an increase in fares. And who should own the buses? We find that this, uh, bus operating companies, they'll have uh, previous operators who know a lot. We can't know that. They are experienced, they know about buses. They are better and able to specify the appropriate technical specifications for the city conditions. So they should be involved when uh, the technical specifications for the buses are being specified and they should also preferably be the ones uh, to own the buses. And also we note that the companies have established relationships with the suppliers over time. So they can be able to negotiate discounted rates uh, for buying the buses and even for buying the spare parts. And private owners have uh, a big financial incentive. They will be more committed to uh, looking after the buses, maintaining the buses, if they own the buses. And also, one very important thing is that the contract duration should match to the lifespan of the buses. So if the, the lifespan of the buses is expected to be 10 years, then the contract duration should be 10 years. How about the depots? Who should own the depots? It is very important that government owns the depots because uh, when government owns the depots, this allows the government to retain the depots in case 
the bus operator changes. You find that uh, between one bus operator and the next bus operator, there is no time. People need to move every day. So you can't be looking for, for a depot or trying to construct a depot. So government needs to own the depot. So in case of change of the operator, uh, the new operator continues operating in the depot. And you find typically in most uh, uh, systems, the government builds and owns the physical structures while the operator provides the movable uh, furniture and equipment and other supplies. It is however very key to involve, for government to involve the operators during the design of a depot because these are the people who know about depots. These are the people who have been operating a, a matatus, the public transport system. They know better than government. So uh, government will sign several contracts uh, with operators. There will be a, a contract between the public transport agency, for example, Namata, with the private bus operators who will procure the vehicles, who will operate the services, and who will maintain the fleet. There'll also be a fair collection uh, contract uh, with the fair collection company, which will uh, procure the fair, fair collection equipment and operate the equipment. There'll also be a contract between a government and the fund manager who will verify the revenues and distribute, pay all the actors. And there will be a contract between government and the station management. The stations need to be cleaned. They need to be maintained. They need to have lighting. There may need to be some landscaping. So there is need for a contract for that purpose. And the control center. The manager will be providing the ITS equipment, maintaining the equipment, and operating at uh, the control center. And uh, looking at various uh, cities, you find that uh, most of the cities uh, have the bus operations uh, privatized. The bus procurement, most of the cities, uh, the bus procurement is done by the private uh, company. Only a few like uh, Rea Vaya and uh, my city in Cape Town. Uh, where the buses were bought by the government. And you find that the fair collection uh, in some of the cities, it's public and in some of the cities, it's private. And the trust fund, most of the times it's uh, public. The control center, most of the time for most of the cities, it is public and the operations planning in all the cities uh, uh, which were studied the operations, are pub, uh, the planning, the operations is done by government. So how about the, the fair collection? Let's look at the fair collection. For government, uh, government needs control of the fair collection. And for it to have the control, uh, once the government has the control, it can be able to, uh, to control uh, the service quality if it controls the revenue through the fair collection. And government will receive uh, information, very clear information on the number of passengers. So data, data is very important uh, so that the government is aware of the demand and how the demand is growing so that it can plan uh, for the future demand. Government will also know how much money uh, is coming in so that uh, also it will be able to plan for the subsidies and for future growth. Government can also uh, be able to have multiple operators who can use the same fair collection system. And this will improve this, the convenience for the passengers. 
Yeah, so that is the, uh, the contracting. Uh, let us now look at the transition. How do we transition from the current uh, operation systems to the, the, the modern bus company? In the transition process, we need to look very keenly, or government needs to be very keen about the organizational structure and the staff compensation of the, the, new, the new company, the new bus operating company. Uh, you find the current situation is that uh, uh, each vehicle is owned or a number of vehicles are owned by an individual or a circle. And the owners are often uh, organized in a circle association or cooperatives or a company. And the fleet is usually maintained by either individuals or the circle. But in the desired situation, uh, we'll have the bus operating company, uh, which um, will own the fleet. And the company uh, will have a formal fleet maintenance protocols. Uh, there'll be uh, the fleet maintenance protocols. So the buses will be in good condition and they, are, they should have proper corporate governance standards. Very important also is the staff compensation. Currently, uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, the vehicle crew are operating under target system. And there's little or no job security. This needs to be improved to where the, the crew members earn a fixed monthly salary. And their, their, their individual performance, there's in, their incentives for best uh, uh, performance like uh, uh, safety issues should be looked into. So while preparing for the transition, the first thing that needs to happen is to identify the affected operators. And the affected operators come in different categories. We have the fully affected uh, operators. These are the operators where the full route or more than half of uh, its initial uh, route is included in the, in the, in the new uh, contract or tender, or the route is uh, altogether canceled. There could also be those partially affected where less than half of its total length is included in the tender. And there are others who are not affected they may be operating uh, uh, the public transport, but their routes are not affected in any way. So the affected operators need to uh, elect uh, their leadership who will participate in the negotiation process with the government. So it's a gradual process. It's a journey, step by step. And I believe this has started happening as we have heard from Namata in the Nairobi situation. So step one is to de defy the service to be tendered. Very important and the roots. Step two is issue a pro prospectus for the business. And step three is to gradually, government needs to gradually start preparing for the change stop renewing the licenses on the affected routes. And step four, identify and register the affected operators. And step five is to uh, advertise, issue the tender uh, with incentives to include the affected operators. Very key to include the affected operators. So should it be competitive or negotiated contract? So managed competitive tender, find that the bidder is selected 
based on the highest quality proposal with the lowest price. It's the normal uh, bidding where the lowest uh, competitive and qualified uh, bid wins the tender. And experience points are awarded to the bidders that include uh, affected operators. So the, the, the company that includes the affected operators gets uh, some marks, very high marks for that. For the negotiated contract, government may choose to negotiate with the operators if they form a modern company and sign a new contract. So there, there, there are certain advantages for a managed competitive tender. As we know, an open tender is more transparent mm -hmm. and the selection process can follow a clear timeline, a defined timeline. And the bidding price is likely to be lower due to the competition. And government is able to set minimum uh, qualification criteria. And this can be enforced. So looking at uh, uh, Transmillennium in uh, Bogota, uh, uh, the kind of contract that was signed, the minimum uh, requirements were that the company is legally registered and has sufficient investment capital. So that was the minimum uh, requirement. Other requirements uh, are the price per kilometer, the bus, whether the bus, uh, uh, is the bus operator in the company, uh, in the city, where they have been, whether they have been operating in the city or in that particular corridor which is affected, whether the company has international experience and the shares held by the small bus owners. There is also the issue of environment and whether the company uh, planned to buy their buses from a local manufacturer that also earned them some points. Mm. So looking at uh, labor and gender issues, it is very important that a priority list or hiring list is prepared. And priority should be given to the staff from the affected or partially affected uh, routes. And there should also be employment benefits, defined working hours, paid annual sick leave, and also maternity leave. And there should be gender representation contract should ensure that there's uh, gender inclusion, including uh, when, you're, when the company is employing drivers, mechanics, and also management, very key. So this, this looks at uh, various uh, uh, systems, uh, BRT systems uh, globally. And we find that uh, quite a number have involved uh, the, in fact, almost all of them have involved the local operators. So that is a very uh, key area for government uh, to look into. So, uh, very important also is for government to think about the compensation because there are some operators who will be retained there are some operators who prefer perhaps to to be compensated and to leave the business altogether so who will the government bring on board and how and who will be bought out and how much how much will the compensation be so uh, this is a very difficult process, but it needs to happen. And it, it needs to happen in good time. So there are the, the industry players have key concerns and for very good reasons. So they'll ask themselves, what will happen to our vehicles? Will the government honor their what? 
Won't we lose our jobs? There are many people who are very concerned about their jobs because the industry employs very huge numbers of people. What about the vehicles without permits and their operating? Others will think that the project sounds good, but is it, is it real? The most important question is how much will I make? Because this is a business. The operators are keen to know the bottom line. And when will the money come? So uh, looking at a modern bus company, what will it look like? So a modern a bus company will own will own the fleet and the fleet will be secured in a depot. And the services will be regulated by operational control system. The drivers will be salaried employees with very, very good terms of service. The, the fleet will be modern, well-maintained. And uh, there'll be modern fully equipped uh, a depot uh, and optimized operations and good corporate governance. There'll be maintenance protocols and sufficient reserve for fleet so that if the, a, a bus uh, breaks down, it becomes now uh, easy for another bus to, to replace it very quickly without uh, affecting uh, the service. So uh, that is what uh, uh, the new but or the desired bus company should look like. And you can get more information from uh, this uh, quick guide to bus sector modernization. Uh, this uh, booklet is uh, prepared uh, by UN Habitat, ITDP, and people-oriented cities. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, engineer, for taking us through a very complex, multi-dimensional subject uh, on reforming the public transport operations and immediately someone jumped in and said, it's not fair, you're exaggerating. The government is involved. They are working with N through NTSA. They are controlling the matatu industry. So to say that the government is not involved is not fair, uh, but rightly so. <laughs> I don't want you to start defending yourself, but to let participants know that we are in a reform and in a transition. And there are two issues happening here. Government is working very, very well to organize the existing operators into circles and conversations are going on to see whether or not they can be used when we get into a BRT system. Those conversations are going on and I don't want to preempt what uh, some of the operators will say. And so to say that government is not involved is actually saying that for a long time, the sector was self-regulating. They did what they wanted. They decided uh, how they'll charge. They decided where to drop you. And what we are then speaking into transitioning to is a more organized bus service. So with that, so that we don't start bashing engineer on uh, that statement, I hope we can uh, then appreciate other issues she brought in subsidy and the government's role in subsidizing the operations. And uh, many people are saying their business is just regulation. They have nothing to do with provision of the service. Uh, so we want to engage in the next couple minutes just so that we begin appreciating the complexity of this issue. Uh, Chris, thank you. I see he's been trying to respond to some of the concerns. Engineer, would you like to look at them and answer 
or how do you want us to tackle this Q&A for the things that you've given us, knowing that you've given us more than uh, we can digest. This is something that will be thought through and thought about, digested beyond this session. But I'm sure we can be able to consolidate and wrap up some ideas. So would you want to respond to questions on the chat? Hey, uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Rehab. Uh, I want to start uh, with the question of the, the government involvement. Yes, uh, first of all, this presentation looks at uh, uh, many cities, not only in Kenya. And we are looking generally, how is the government participation in the industry? And you'll find that this industry is mainly private sector, it's private business. There is regulation, but it's to some extent. And that is why I was saying initially there was hardly any regulation. But gradually, we are moving. We are not at the beginning. We are moving. We are in a journey. We are at a situation where the government is issuing uh, licenses. But most of the times, uh, it more or less stops there. Maybe a bit of traffic, police here and there. Government needs to play a bigger role in public transport uh, provision. Government needs to budget for public transport. Government needs to enforce level of service. You find that uh, sometimes the matatus, some of the matatus, there are some which are very good, but there are many which are not in very good condition. And the level of service tends to go uh, very low because of government absence. And in fact, uh, Igini Agitao was with us yesterday and he admitted that government has largely been absent in public transport provision. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can look at, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to see that uh, the counties are now providing uh, toilet facilities at the terminal. That is a very good move in the right direction. Uh, let me see. So do we need subsidies? Or are we just ad uh, adapting them since they are recommended? I think we need subsidies. I once sat uh, with a chairman of a Matatu uh, operating circle. And they told me it is very difficult. It's a very difficult business, very difficult. And uh, most of the people who are investing in the business eventually have to pull out because they can't even pay their loans. So it's also very expensive to maintain the cars, the vehicles. They have to buy the tires. Uh, we'll get Dixon to tell us uh, is the, the operators themselves uh, should share their experiences. But I believe it's a very expensive business. It's normally not uh, so profitable as uh, sometimes you might think. And many governments uh, worldwide are supporting public transport to ensure that because if they do not, sub, if government does not subsidize, the cost is reflected in the fare. That is why uh, if I'm traveling from uh, Kiambu to Nairobi, I'll pay 100 shillings and 100 shillings back. So the fare is very high. So to make this, the, the service affordable, then government needs to come in and provide uh, or assist in provision of that service. Uh, uh, what would be the most convenient? Okay, time to break. Uh, what would be the most convenient time to break, even especially if the private operator was to invest in the BRT instead of government? I do not get that question, Rehab. Uh, uh, do you get the question? Yes, I do. And I keep, with all due respect, saying this is a complex subject 
where the financial and operational modeling needs to be done so that the operator's uh, level of profit can be calculated for us to answer the question. You know, this person wants to know how long will the private operator take to be able to break even, uh, get a profit, and find the whole thing attractive. If you are saying that the operations should be run by private operators and not the government providing the full service, including operations. And I'm saying that again, this modeling, because it would have been good if someone was presenting a model that shows us the operations, the starting point. And uh, Dar es Salaam has done a bit of that. It's unfortunate that they've been called to a government meeting, so we don't have them uh, on board officially. And uh, Shauri from Da, if you're here and you have an example of how this has worked in Dar es Salaam, we'll be happy to hear you uh, because it's difficult for us to tell you the time it will take, whether it's uh, immediately or two years after the service or five. It also depends on the way that the operations were set up in the first place. That's my quick reaction. But if Shauri, you're on call and you think you have a response, Yes, um, I'm here. Um, this is a very interesting subject. And uh, fortunately, I was part of the, uh, in the process of um, getting the contracts for the operators in bo on board and get the operators uh, 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 getting the buses. Uh, the first thing I think we need to take on board is we really need to be very careful from the outset of the project. Uh, we need to, uh, to engage the private sector from the planning stage and um, throughout the process with the operations. If they are not, uh, for sure they will not, uh, especially the uh, current bus operators whom the, the, the operations of the Dara Dara's here in Daslam, for example, is they are, is, is they are living. And if you don't involve them, they need to know the benefits of the project, uh, what uh, they will have in future, and how they'll be getting their daily bread uh, as it is now. So it's very crucial that uh, the, the, the private sector is engaged from the very beginning. But also one thing uh, I want to share with uh, Nairobi and the others who are implementing BRT is that um, the involvement here in Dar es Salaam, for example, we started with the interim service. Which I think in Nairobi, you call it as a pilot. Once you have that pilot, you have to make sure that uh, you need to know or define how they are going, their, their, their project, their, their time of operations, for example. That because uh, once they are in the operations, it's not, and you won't, get, you won't be able to get them out. Um, because um, they will have invested a lot of money into buying of the buses and the, and the fare collection system, and they have to recoup back their money. So it's you need to be very careful in the involvement of the private sector, especially in the interim or in the, as you call it, a pilot project uh, phase in Nairobi. But another thing I want also to share with you is. Um, because there have been a lot of uh, discussion on the who does what. Uh, here in Dar es Salaam, for example, the government was involved, fully involved in the planning process of the BRT, which took some time. Uh, it started here in 2002, and um, the designs for the BRT were completed in 2007, and the construction of the phase one of the BRT was completed in uh, 2015, and the operations started, interim operations started in 2016. So you can imagine, you can see the kind of time that it, took, it takes. It's not an easy, it's not an easy thing. We need really to, we need all it to be thought through very thoroughly. And so the government do the planning and uh, construct the BRT infrastructure like any other roads, and they provide the specifications for the buses as well. 
and then let the private sector bring in the buses using the specifications that were prepared by the government and let the operators operate the buses and maintain them. And here in Dar Salaam, for example, we provided, uh, the government provided a, a depot for free to the operator so that they, to ensure that the buses are well maintained uh, and, they are, and, and they are in a good service. And then uh, the, in the operations, the government is the one who monitors and regulated, regulates the services according to the provide uh, the agreed contract agreement signed between the two the parties. So that's the experience from Dar es Salaam. Um, on the engagement of the Dalla Dalla operators, as I said, it's, that's, a, that's the most difficult part of the uh, project here in Dar es Salaam. Uh, if they are not well um, taken on, uh, addressed, it's not well addressed, it's for sure, uh, the, it's going to be, will be a, a helps. And um, I remember one of the times they even say that they're not, uh, they're going to block the, the, the BRT system, uh, the, the, the bus lanes, uh, using their, 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 their buses, you know? So it's, uh, that's, the, that's the difficult part of the operations and it needs to be dealt uh, very clearly. Thank you very much. I think um, if there's any other question, I'll be happy to, to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Shauri. Let me just ask a question. In your situation, I understand the Daladala operators, some opted to be paid out of the routes that they were operating and they left the business altogether. The ones who stayed formed that uh, association, I forget the name. Eh? Uda they yes. Uda, uh, Uda Rapid Transit. Uda, yes, Uda Rapid Transit. Yeah. How is that working? Um, you know, here in Dar es Salaam, we had Uda, it was uh, initially a public uh, uh, transport company, and it was bought out by private sector. And then uh, when we are really trying to work out how we are going to involve those uh, the Adela operators, because it's like here in Dar es Salaam, it's, not, it's unlike Nairobi, how you have uh, strong associations. Here is everybody for himself. I mean, uh, the buses, are, they, they are no strong associations which are uh, like in Nairobi. So it was uh, really very difficult to get everybody uh, and come up together with a common uh, uh, goal. So the order took up saw this advantage and uh, took this advantage and, and uh, to uh, talk to the other, because Uda was also operating as a Dala Dala. And, and he had, he had, by that time it had more than a hundred or 200 buses. And so it, 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 offers, it offered to compensate, not a really compensate, but uh, to, it's like, uh, it, it gave out man, a small amount of money. And that money was meant to, get the dollars on board, like, um, so that they can as well, because the, the, the ultimate goal was to order to be transformed into a public company. So mm -hmm. the dollars, they were informed that they would buy shares into the UDRT. So that's where, how they, 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 they join in. Okay. But, uh, and uh, according to the, um, uh, Agreement, the contract agreement within the order, because that by that time we had a draft contract, which we also shared with the Dara Dallas and the other bus stakeholders in Dar es Salaam. There was a company, there was a company in the in the contract that the thirty percent of the shares should go into the to the to the, to the private sector. I mean, to the Dara Dallas, purely to the Dara Dallas, and the rest then will go will remain either with the with the order with the order. Uh, of which UDA government had a stake of uh, 49%. So that's how we, we, we engaged, the, that's how the, the whole thing uh, came up. But okay. um, as of now, it's still working, but uh, um, the, the situation has really changed now because uh, the government has bought more stake into the UDA RRT, and now it is, uh, uh, 
the percent, the share structure is now is uh, 85 percent, 15 to the private. So it's like uh, becoming more like a more like a way of a public company. But uh, there are still some uh, discussions going on within the government that the and the and the and the financial and the financing and the financier of the uh, who is the World Bank uh, because we, we had a. a, a a condition in the in the financing argument that the whole thing should go to the private and the government should not do business because it, it has been doing that in the past and it couldn't uh, do it better. So that's how we, we that, that's how the thing is working here in Dar Salaam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you've given us some insights. Uh, it's a pity that uh, the CEO is not able to come in because he has a very clear presentation on the journey of how they've transitioned. And like Shauri says, government is now taking more shares in the running of the operations than was the case when the negotiations with the, the Dalla Dalla operators began. I'm very careful on this subject because we can throw many things, but it helps when you have a real case study that we are looking at. So Shauri, I thank you for the insights that you've given us. Uh, it underscores the importance of modeling and agreeing on the onset what the role of government is vis-a-vis -vis that of the industry operators. Uh, the other thing I've learned from your brief is that these roles evolve as you experience the operations, as you learn the lessons. So nothing is cast on stone and nothing happens on day one. And hopefully uh, Dixon has just been in touch with me. He's trying to connect. He'll be able to brief us where they are at with no matter on this issue. Because it helps when you hear the real experience. What engineer presented is obviously different experiences across the globe, but many people have advised that we need to contextualize all this information. So Shauri, we may call on you later. Uh, allow us to address a few more concerns, please. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, but we will call on you definitely. Where we are stuck, because Nairobi has not gone through this, Engineer Jerry has not had it uh, applied in Kenya, we will call on you and thank you uh, for thank that. You. Thank you very Engin much. Yes, there's a concern here that, I think Engineer, you said that the private sector contract should go up uh, to the end of the bus lifespan. I think that's what this person understood. And they're asking if the contract duration matches bus's lifespan, wouldn't that result in a decreased service quality? Because buses will be worn out, uh, you don't have capital to replace them immediately and so on. And this can be answered by any other person who has, oh an experience. Yeah, that maybe I can invite Chris. Chris, uh, you can respond to that. Hi, Jerry. Yeah, I just missed the question. Can you, can you state it again? If the contract duration matches the bus's lifespan, wouldn't that result in a decreased service quality around the end of the contract? due to buses being worn out and not replaced. Thanks. Yeah, sure, that, that's definitely a concern. And, and so the idea is not to set the contract duration at the point where the, you know, the buses would be completely broken down and unroadworthy, but to try to set it in advance of that um, so that the buses are still operating well by the end of the contract. But yeah, it clearly requires a good oversight of the system to make sure that the buses, you know, stay up and running, and and there should be, you know, clear incentives in the contract to, you know, to create a, to put this in the financial interest of, of the operator. And what what some cities do um, is to maintain a standard for the the average age of the buses. So especially in cities where where the bus operators have a combination of new and old buses, so they they set the factor you know, set a, a, an average age limit. So you can have some, um, you know, new and some old buses, but as the buses get older, you have to keep replacing them continuously. 
And then one other factor that's very important is to ensure that there's a reserve fleet so that even if some buses um, go out of service, that you have other vehicles um, that can you know, come on the corridor um, while the repairs are being made. So those are a couple of ways that that, that risk can be mitigated. But yeah, it, it's something that the governments need to be careful to track. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, Rehab, maybe I can attempt uh, uh, the concern by Mr. Miner. I think we are trying to import ideas and make them work here in Kenya. Kenyans are already heavily taxed. Where will the subsidies come from? Uh, what I can say about uh, trying to import ideas. Uh, first, we do not want to start uh, reinventing the wheel. These things have happened elsewhere. Lessons have been learned. Uh, cities uh, know what to do and what not to do. And I think the best thing is not to try new things. Uh, we need to look at other cities. How are they going about this? Cities have been there. They've been, these problems have, uh, have been there before and they have been dealt with. So we are looking at cities which are similar to our cities here in Kenya, in, in Africa, uh, and trying to see how we can deal with this uh, situation which we find ourselves in the public transport uh, uh, systems. So I believe it's very good to look at other cities, see how problems were solved and borrow best practices and try to implement them here. Of course, it's very important to um, put them into context and, uh, and make them fit to our situation. And uh, in terms of uh, taxation, uh, we partly we are not saying uh, that Kenyans, there should be new taxes. Perhaps the taxes that uh, can, could be introduced are taxes to reduce uh, use of private car. Because what is happening, uh, a private car is a very inefficient uh, space user. And we are having a lot of pollution. So we really must get uh, Kenyans uh, to reduce uh, using private cars and to start using public transport, walking, cycling, the sustainable modes of transport. So how is the government going to, to do that? One is to uh, manage parking. If you provide more and more parking, cheap parking, that attracts more people to use private cars. But if you charge parking, for example, if you charge per hour, so that the, the, the drivers feel the, the cost, then you will have less people uh, driving private cars. So we must reduce the availability of parking and increase the cost. And that money that comes out of that can be used for the uh, sustainable modes of transport like uh, uh, public transport or like extending the NMT, improving the NMT, the walkways, the cycle tracks. Yeah, so we need to move in that direction if we are going to deal with the current challenges of congestion and uh, uh, issues of urban transport. Also to do with um, the fuel level, the fuel level goes to the construction of roads. And we find that if we construct more and more roads, especially in the urban environment, we are attracting more cars. So government needs to consider uh, taking some of this money and putting it into public transport. It's a matter of priorities. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Engineer, have... allow me to call on Johan Rieger to make an intervention. Kindly. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, good morning from my side. Um, we have Two faced. Minutes. 
In Nigeria, for example, we are currently implementing a project called CES, the Clean Environment, uh, Clean Economic. And um, in this project, we have faced the problem that uh, not only the specification of buses is sometimes not appropriate. But, sorry, I just hear myself. But the, um, the, especially the training of drivers and also maintenance is one of the big issues. Uh, we can have the best. We can have the best specification of buses if the if the training of drivers is not appropriate and the maintenance, and we don't have uh, predictable maintenance, we will not be able to extend the lifespan. International uh, examples have shown that the lifespan of buses in public transport can be, and especially in BRT, minimum 15 years. And this is what we should target, I think, and it is possible also to implement it in, in Kenya. Uh, especially if you, if especially if you plan like you do now with uh, with the BRT system, you have the infrastructure that allows long lifespans. Thank you for that intervention. Uh, there are very many facets to this discussion. He's brought out the issue of maintenance of buses and training of drivers. Uh, engineer, would you pick on another one? People are beginning to say, why would government be involved in public transport provision at all? Should this not be left to the private sector, both collecting of the fares and even in the operations of the buses? So that's just a view. And we are saying from your explanation that if we don't involve government, then we'll continue with the current state of public transport provision. So yes, government will come in to regulate. They may not be the ones dipping into the fare box, but they have a role to play. Uh, would you comment on that quickly so that we gain some ground on other things? Uh, yes, indeed, government needs to come in. Government needs to play a big role in public transport provision. It's a service, just like any other service. And uh, we as uh, the consumers of the service, the public, uh, need good service. And uh, if the government leaves this service to the private sector, then we get uh, the service that we are getting today. We need better service. We need more people to leave their cars at home because there is good public transport. You leave your car at home and jump into a BRT and be able to move from point A to point B until government comes in and enforces a good service and high service levels. Uh, you'll find that uh, many people will not, uh, and those who can afford cars will not use uh, public transport. And we'll continue buying cars and congesting the roads. And some cities have suffered from this because what happens is that when the roads get too congested, people start using uh, motorbikes. So some cities in Southeast Asia are crying and it becomes very difficult to reverse the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dixon Bogua, have you been able to connect? Dixon from the Matatu Welfare Association and the Federation of Public Transport Operators. Yesterday, Maina mentioned that the government is mobilizing the existing industry. So we are not too far away, we are there. And we wanted to hear from uh, Dixon Bogua some of the things that are happening and how they are dealing with uh, the financial and operations models. Dixon, are you with us? Okay, uh, I think he's not been able to connect yet. I will check on him. Uh, Dixon, are you there yet? Okay, it seems Dixon is not yet on call. So engineer, would you like to respond to 
one more question that is being asked, if you can reach it to it. Uh, there is a question by Henry Kamau. If the companies are allowed to specify the buses, they will always select the lowest cost option to maximize profits at the expense of the user. Uh, what I can say to this is that, um, uh, and what we are proposing is that the government should involve uh, the companies when they are coming up with the specifications for the buses. Because these companies have dealt with buses. They have been oh. the You cannot ignore their experience. Uh, and then the, after the companies buy the buses, because we are uh, recommending that the companies buy the buses, and they are going to maintain the buses. If you buy cheap, and this is, sometimes cheap is expensive in terms of maintenance, in terms of uh, lifespan. So uh, I believe if the companies know that they are the ones uh, to buy the buses, to maintain the buses, uh, and to operate the buses, uh, they want good buses. So yeah, that's my take. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dixon, can you hear me now? Hello, Dixon, can you hear us? Hello? Uh, participants, I just talked to Dixon on phone and he is asking me if we can hear him. So he's, hello? Uh, hello, Dixon? Hello? Uh, maybe Rehab, as uh, you try to get Dixon, uh, we can have uh, Shauri, Ijinia Shauri, uh, respond to this question. Does government have to control fair collection? Uh, Miss, maybe Ijinia, you can tell us uh, your experiences in this. Uh... Ijinia, Jerry, could you please uh, repeat that question? What, what is it exactly you want me to say? Uh, this is a question by um, Mr. Aruha Tinka. Does government have to control fair collection? I think to be more acceptable, the operators could control and government only needs to have full awareness of how much is collected. Full access to operating data. I hope you got it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in Dar es Salaam, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just bring, trying to bring in our experience from Dar es Salaam. Here in Dar es Salaam, we have the Land uh, Transport uh, Regulating Authority, LATRA, which is uh, regulating all uh, land transport in Tanzania, including in the urban areas. So, and that uh, organ, that, that is a government institution. So yes, uh, it's good to have the government regulated the, the affairs, but, it should be a fair, a win-win situation whereby all the, the bus operators are also uh, consulted and they come to consensus to reach the uh, agreeable uh, fair. So it should not be uh, dictated by the government, but it should be a democratic kind of uh, consensus whereby both the operators, uh, I mean, the bus operators and the government come into consensus because the government wants the public transport to be um, affordable to the, to the public and the bus operators want to make some profit because they are, that's, a, that, that, that's business. So it should be a win-win kind of um, agreement between the private and the government. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eugenia. I think I the person also was talking about if the operator is presenting the data to government on revenue collection and they've agreed on a formula on what the operator takes, what the government takes, because government has a stake in this public transport, 
Remember we said it's providing infrastructure, the depots, taking charge of the centralized ITS equipment or whatever the arrangement is. And the person is really saying, if government and the operator can use data on uh, revenues and levels, does government need to have direct control of that revenue? And if I'm wrong, I stand to be corrected, but that was what the question is really pointing to. Can we use data to communicate with each other between government and the operator and not have government directly deal with uh, the fares, what's coming in, what's going out? Yeah. Rehab, if you can um, briefly say something on that. Um, the data is an outcome of the, it should be used as a kind of um, check and balance. Um, but the, the, to see what goes into the, that big pot. Uh, and uh, because in the contract, there should be an agreement uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on how, who gets what from the, from the, from the fair box. All the money is collected in one um, bucket and then distributed to the to the to the to the to the, to the operators. Say if it is the fair collector, the bus operator, or the fund manager. In, in the case of Dasaram, so at the end of the day, for each to get his share, his share, you need to know exactly how much goes into that big pot. So uh, the and the the ITS, that's the also. Do in, in uh, other than collecting the money or the fares, it also uh, generate um, uh, information on 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 the on the on the number of tickets sold, how much, and all those kind of, and 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 the uh, and, and the passengers which who bought the buses. So all those should go into as a kind of information, which at the end of the day will be analyzed and. Uh, Everybody gets what he deserves from the from the fair box. In the case of Dar es Salaam, mm -hmm. I'm sure there was a contract with the operator, and the fair yeah. box was a, an open thing between government and the operator. So, did it work well? Were there challenges that are still being sorted out? As I mentioned, it's not it's not that easy eh? because with the technology one can do anything, but um, uh, it needs to be transparent. Transparency should be the key into the systems because uh, mm -hmm. one can deal with the can they do anything with the systems. So the, the issue here is the transparency and the openness and uh, you know each party should be. Uh, I mean, all the system should be transparent with everybody. To the, I mean, to the parties, so that um, all what is, is is collected goes into that pocket and then distributed according to the agreed formula to the to the to the service providers. Thank you, um, and I know that in Dar es Salaam you had some challenges with the previous operator. Some things were not disclosed. Uh, so again, it's a learning curve. I don't want to go too deeply into your experience, but you've said useful things there. The initial contract needs to be very clear to both parties. And then transparency and trust are fundamental principles in this whole game between a private sector operator and government, including data and how this data is used. Bugia uh, Wasioya, I'll give you the space, please. Take two minutes. Boogie, your hand is up. Are you able to connect? Can you hear us or can we move on? Sorry. We seem to be having a response problem from Buge. And I want us to close this session. We have a few more things that we want to look into. Buge? Okay. We'll take a short break for the Dasta 
uh, uh, for Carol rather to, to take us through a poll just to give us a breather and then we'll move on to listen to the experience of Kigali. Carol? Um, yes, so we will administer a poll. Um, I saw someone asking um, if some of the participants here actually use public transport. Um, so we want to find out. Um, so we will do a poll on the mode of transport frequently used and also on um, how the government should manage traffic. Problem. Buge, did you have a problem connecting? Uh, I'm trying. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you very well. Kindly make your intervention okay. because you're about to close this session. Yeah, okay. Uh, what I wanted to just say is that, uh, you know, this issue, I, I think we need a little more time before we agree on uh, how to proceed with this uh, system because it isn't like it is only private sector that can be efficient or government because there are places where you find government runs the public transport and they are quite efficient. And I think one place that I find that is like in Rwanda, you find that most of the money is government, but it's very efficient. You can also have private sector, which is also efficient. It is just how do you regulate the service provision. But I, I, I was mentioning that uh, in our country, we, we I think there's something to learn from what Safaricom has done. I know they are in a country different- Country are you from? I'm from Kenya. I'm, Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Kenyan. I'm, uh, I have been in uh, regulation. I, I have done energy regulation for a long time. So I know that regulation can uh, have a big impact on how business delivers uh, value to the citizens. So really, I think the biggest problem we have is how do we regulate? And I, I, I'm looking at, for example, if I am in Kijabe Street and I need to go to uh, 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 railway station, uh, how will the new system facilitate me rather than forcing me then to use either Boda Boda or to use an Uber? If we regulate our uh, services properly, even with the existing uh, vehicles that we have, it is still possible for us to have efficiency. But unfortunately, government has failed in regulating the transport sector. And, and this is something that I think we need to sit together and see how do we move forward? Because it can be done and it can be done very quickly. I mean, in terms of the infrastructure, if you, you can put up infrastructure, which you then misuse. I mean, look at Helselasi Road uh, Avenue from uh, the country bus. Out of three lanes, I think only one lane these days is used by vehicles. The rest of it is either people selling bogas on the streets or mkokotenis or whatever. All these things is because as government, we have failed to do proper regulation of transport. Thank you for that intervention. Um, I'm telling you this is a very complex, complex subject. It would have been very good if DART was able to present in some detail their own experience with financial modeling, business modeling, how the operations have been since they launched the BRT, because then we'd be picking very real tips on what not to do and what we can borrow. But unfortunately, like I said, they were involved in government meetings. Jinia Shauri has done a very good job to respond to some of our questions and we appreciate. Engineer Jerry, I appreciate your courage putting together all the complex uh, aspects of uh, public transport industry reform. There are many in depth, in width, we have barely scratched the surface today, but I wish that for next time, if we are talking about this subject, we ensure that we have one or two countries that have actually implemented the BRT in the region and we analyze 
and scrutinize some of the lessons that they'll be sharing with us. But for now, I want to thank you, engineer, for the presentation. Thank you, Shauri, Buge, and others who have responded. And one of the presentations we need to listen to is the Kigali case. Kigali is always ahead in the region. Uh, but before we do that, before I invite Vedaste, Carol, would you give us the results of the poll? Thank you. And from these results, uh, many of us here use private vehicles. Many of you, 54% of those on this call use private vehicles, 31% public transport, walking 8%, cycling 3%, border borders 3%. What does this tell us? That we are still very comfortable in our private vehicles because the public transport is not yet where we'd like it to be. And this is what we are trying to aim for. How can we get an efficient public transport, as engineer said, to get people leave their private vehicles for short journeys and use public transport, but a public transport that is well organized, that is reliable, that is accessible. Uh, thank you very much, Carol. And I'd like us to now change gear and give the dust the floor to tell us what is happening in Kigali, matters public transport. The dust, please. Thank you. Hello, Vedaste. Can people hear him? We can see the presentation. Am I the only one not hearing Vedaste? Oh, we are many. We are, okay. we are not hearing. We are many. We are many. Eh? Let's be patient. Maybe his gadget is... Uh, a challenge, let's give him a minute, please. Hello, Vedaste. Vedaste, please check your audio, we cannot hear you. I think his microphone is off. Your microphone could be off. His microphone is OK. OK, so it could be another challenge. Maybe his device has a problem. OK. Dixon Bogua, were you able to speak to us? So Vedaste may be having problems with his gadget. Uh, and I appreciate people saying that we do need another session on this with real life examples and with uh, direct questions to people dealing with high capacity BRT operations in the region. Some people have said Riavaya, examples from DART, examples from La Mata would be very good to help us internalize a lot of what engineer Jerry presented. So Vedaste is saying we give him time to restart. Hopefully his gadgets will work. And these things are very common. Thank you for staying on members. Uh,
Wow. May I suggest we move to Penina and then we can have the duster if the struggle is taking long to fix his gadgets. That, that's okay, okay. Car Carol is posting another poll. Let's take the poll. Maybe in another two minutes, it'll be ready. What is the best way to manage traffic in Nairobi? Let's take this poll and then hopefully by that time, the duster will be on board so that we finish the public transport reforms and then get on to TOD. Carol, the poll should be finished, I think. What is the best way to manage traffic in Nairobi? Many thought introduce Matatu routes that do not start or end in the CBD. Uh, I take this to mean that introduce Matatu's that can have journeys across the CBD so that we are not all stuck in the CBD. Uh, then the other people say reduce parking spaces and increase parking fees. Obviously that cannot be done on its own. We must give people uh, alternatives uh, to move around. If you're telling them not to park in the city, they must have an efficient public transport. Uh, mode, expand roads. Very few of you think we should expand roads, uh -huh. and I'm could glad you, could you, that is could it. Could you hear me now? Yes, the duster, have... just give, yes, the duster, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Yes, please uh, carry yes. on. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Could you also see my, my screen? Yes, yes, but please use the full screen. Okay, thanks. Ah, finally, and sorry. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks for the patience. It has been a long, I don't know what happened with my system. Yeah, I, I, I will be taking you through the Kigari public transform, Kigari public transport reforms. And from the people maybe who will not be aware of the Chigari, the city of Chigari, I will start with the general city overview where the city started. Yeah, it seems like the city founded with the, in the years of 1907 and it's become the capital city of Rwanda in 1962. And as you could see from the overall picture from the beginning, the, that's all the very traditional buildings. Honestly, the, what is the, CP, the CBD now? And you could see the, the, the blue picture, the system totally changed. And what I could say from the chronology of the city during the, the genocide against Tutti, which happened in the country in 1994, it seems like everything destroyed and the country seems like it started either from the country as a country as well as from the city. But now the city it is striving to become more clean, green and safe city as well. As, and of course, from its situation, the area of the city, it remained constant with the square kilometer of seven, 731 and the, the Unfortunately, the population trend keep increasing. Where we are now having no. the population estimated no. to 1.5 million, which are projected to become 
around 4 million in 2050. And regarding the evolution of the transport system in the city of Chigari, I tried to, to design it in a part of years where I have I have the, the one from up to 1994, 2008, 2013, as 2020, as well as the current situation. More specifically from the years of 90 and 70s up to 1994, the system seems to be the same. In 2080s and 2008, some reform started, yeah, to organize what, what was the existing minibuses. In Kenya, they are called the Matatu, and here is, they, are, they are known as Twegeran. And in 2013, yeah, early 2012, as well as 2013, more reforms have taken place from the policy level up to further uh, implementation in the system. And finally, 2020, some good things talks, takes place that I will explain in detail by the. the the, the, the clear background, I could, as I stated, the, the wording public transport system started by the years of 1970s. Actually, by one man, it's not in the city for the people who, know, who brought a, a minibus with 16 seats, and he put it in the city center to found the, himself to found the, the, the percent, or that's the, 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 the known story. And in the years of 70s up to 90s, the public transport keep that move where the people who own money used to buy the, the minibuses and they put to the, road, to the street for themselves to find the passengers. And a very funny story about the wording Pejerane, which is the local naming, has come from that concept that the people keep increasing, the, the percentage keep increasing in the city, while the, the, the number of free were quite limited due to the number of the people, of course, who have capacity, the businessmen who have capacity to buy buses. Then what happened, even if the minibus was with 16 and 18 seat, the, the, the buses conductor used to call many people to, to, to move in to squeeze themselves inside the minibuses. And sometimes they used to set like 30 or 28 people used to be in those kind of minibuses. It seems like over than 100% of their capacity. And when th th that wording of the, the conductor were calling the, for the, the percentage, they used to use the term for the people who are inside, which means squeeze yourself, squeeze yourself. Then the, the minibuses take the name from there. and Continuing to the background, what happening from that time up to up to 90s, the, the system was continually being composed with the minibuses as I started, but they become more and more overcrowded. The individuals who own those minibuses were deciding that the road to operate, at which time they used to operate. And this, this one has resulting in chaos especially during the, the peak hours in the bus stop and terminals, as well as across the route. And the other things, the vulnerable people like women, children, elderly and disabled people were not, were, were not able to access the, the, those minibuses, not only to access, uh, but, but also was not even possible to get the, the seats because the people were pushing to get in. And continuing with, 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 that, with that situation, that's what came up for the government to have a role in the years of 2008 and start progressing the, a kind of what called reforms, where they at least called the minibuses owner to group themselves into association and to save the vulnerable people the, 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 the government and through the system of the first come, first served, where they created the, 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 the queues. You have to wait for the, the queues to enter into the, those minibuses. The system 
or uh, con actually continues up to now. Uh, but unfortunately, with all of that, the system keep become more unreliable, sensors inadequate and inefficient. And in line with those things, the government jump in, more specifically in the years of 2011, uh, 2011 and 2000, uh, as well as 2012. What happened, a joint technical team has been made from the Ministry of Infrastructure, which is the, who are developing the transport policy in Rwanda, the city of Chigari as the local authority, as well as the, the, the Rwanda regulatory services who are participating a lot in the service here in Rwanda. And the joint team tried to draft a, a policy which has been approved by the, the cabinet in 2012. And apart fr from that drafted, within that drafted policy, the team formed a steering committee which were overseeing by, by the prime minister offices. And this steering committee was followed the, the approved policies and tried to, to, do, to, to find some more solution to the problem which were on, on the ground. And those reforms were of course to, were, or for, were, were of course included to formulate some cooperatives and the company from the formal association resulted from 2008 taken actions. And of course, much more resistance has been raised from the, the, the those former minibuses owners, and the people are not convinced of what, what, what's going on. That was really the very huge work for that steering committee, what, what worked a lot to convince them. And from that kind of reforms, the, 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 those reforms resulted in, in the system where the, the former buses association, uh, mini buses association united themselves to formulate like one, Federation, which is called Rwanda Federation of Transport Corporation, are really transformed to Jari Transport, that is the, the current name, moved from those RFTC to Jari Transport and is the biggest camp, public transport company in the city currently. And the other owners, uh, other minibuses owners formed the, the, some big companies where like, like Higari Bus Services, as well as the Royal Express, of course, and others. And within, in August, 2013, through the competitive tendering process, three company on the, the, the contract to, to provide public transport in the city, which are LFTC, KBS and Loyal Express. And those one are, ha, have been, given the mandate to operate the clearly defined, defining the road. And the reform later on continued with that steering committee where the, the, the government provide facil some facilities to access on, to, on those companies. So the, the companies requested to import the high capacity buses, which consistently replaced the low capacity I stated before. And Honestly, take a process because that many people to resist and they was losing their business or asking to serve for the feeder services, which was not profitable compared to the compared to the city one. But finally, yeah, something happened. And some good new things now start to come in. We are for instance, the operators now they are importing the free with facilities, with, with facilities to help the people with disability and provide some seat for the vulnerable peoples and the consistent service inspection has been taken in the place by state steering committee to ensure the consistent improvement of the services. And all of those reforms, those take, those take place also had an impact, a very big impact on the drivers and uh, the service direct practitioners. Prior to those reforms, what was happening, the drivers don't have the fixed salaries. Their wages were depending on the, 
the, the, the minibuses owner benefit. If I could say, they said they only return and they give them wages depending on the remaining balance. But after, after the reform, what happens is they get a fixed salary and some good things like the universal insurance and their working time have been given time. At least they are now working for 15 days per month, but yeah, yeah, with 18 hours per day, which I can say is still long. And there is some more advantages. Like if you are you are a contractor driver, you could access some you could access some bank loan from LFTC or Jari funded microfinance. And in addition to that, also some smart techno some smart technology has been taken in place. For instance, in 2015, the free Wi-Fi has provided into the the public buses some cashless system. The smart card payment technology has been introduced, and what what happening now? An independent, uh, a given service prov local service provider is known as SC Group, used to collect the fares and distribute to the to the operator. But the the one remaining remaining thing from the the move set with engineer, his his he's held accountable to the operators. The government don't control the, the fare collectors. He's, he gets some percentage from the collected fare, but he report himself, he signed a contract with direct with operator, not with the government, which, uh, which I can say is still a move to go. And of course, this IT-based fare replaced the the, the, the conductor who, who used to collect the, the manual fare, which was also a very challenging thing. And from that mode, in the current status, we could have some kind of the, the buses, how many buses are available now, but the, the good thing is the percentage of buses with high capacity incre increased a lot. If I could say, if you, you could from the beginning, we used to have a fleet of around 900, 900 buses. Of course, because it was a mix of those small buses and big buses, but now the, the small one, they are being replaced by the, 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 high capacity, the high capacity one. And currently we could have the daily, the, the, the daily patronage, which is around three, 190,000 passenger per day. Or they, are, they are going back, decreasing and increasing due to the system which seems to be like constant, but yeah, something keeps changing compared to 200, 200,000 passengers, the system started in 2013. And the other things I could say is for the, the bus operational speed, which has on average, like 12 kilometer per hour, then yeah, many of the time reaching below 10 during the, the peak hours, which also need, which also show some point where the city really needs to, to, to move on. And coming, coming up with the real current situation of COVID-19, where the public transport have been really heated with the situation due to COVID, the cabinet of what they decided many of the time to request the, the operators to provide, to offer their services at 50% at capacity. Then what happened, they, they were losing money and that were problematic. All is where the government have a very good move, a, go, a, a move that I could say the very good one and commit to provide some subsidies estimated to 29 billion Rwandan francs to operators. And these were decided to take place since October 2020. And this amount was estimated to be spent during a period of 12 months. And those subsidies were also provided into three categories. What the government do, it used to pay to provide payment of 35% for the 
for the operator's loan. If you're an operator and you have the bank loan, the government pay this percentage to your loan and they deduct some, some money from the fuel. This is the tax that the government used to dedicate to them. Actually, they, they decrease a percentage of 10% of fuel per liter. They, 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 yeah, they provide around uh, 150 Rwandan francs. The, this is subsidized by the government. And from the remaining balance, they provide the direct payment. And what happened, as I said, if the, from the data provided by the fair corrector, stated SC group, if you, ca you carry on the 50% the, the of your passengers, the government has to fill a gap of that 50%. That one from the paying of the loan and deducting the, that cost from the fuel, they, they provide you with the, the direct financing. There is a technical team, yeah, also resulted from the stated steering committee, which is to calculate all of this. Then the government targeted to pay it on a monthly basis. And from all of those, the city, uh, there is uh, a proposed way forward where the city is planning for the second generation contract, aiming to enhance a very reliable system, which will improve the bus route. Also, we come up with the increased capacity to cater for rent and demand with a very strict scheduling and with a changed fare structure to be in line with travel distance. O of course, they are back of back and forth discussion within the the incision here to adopt the gross cost contracting model as stated by 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 engineer where he, he were descri describing it from the net cost one hopefully by this second generation since it will be in the place it will be good and from its story of what happened the the city was planned to have it before, but all of the, the existing operator has been failed to comply with all of those conditions provi provided with the, their bidding system. Of course, there they, they were many concerns, some are known and the other, of course, are not known, but it was that, that kind of the contract as engineer was stating, which was not giving waiver to the new operators the existing one was very consistent and strict on their thing. And, and, and the terms, I could say that we're not giving a waiver to the new one to come in. Yeah, but hopefully that the government is doing a lot to improve and the, the, the good generation, we, we are expecting to have the, the second generation, which will tackle on the current problem that you have in the system. And the city also, they, they, they are now doing something to, give some provisionals for the bus dedicated land as well as reality in the future. Some preliminary studies are moving on to look on their, their feasibility. Hopefully the city will adopt it soon. And there is some back and forth discussion on the destruction on the motor taxi here, especially for the trunk road. Yeah, in, in Kenya, they used to, used to call them border border, which are helping a lot but also the motorcycle taxi here. It's a things which are quite critical because they are more flexible. They can access from all of the corner of the cities. Then the people, they are choosing it. And those motorcycles, the one they used to call the matatus, they are coming up with different issues like more accidents. They are coming up with a lot of pollution and the other things and the people they are discussing whether they could be distracted on the, the main corridor and being served as the, the provide the feeder services. Those are the discussion which are going back and forth, which could help also to have a more reformed services in Kigali. Of course, if it's come with the second generation contract, it, it could be good. But as I stated before, all of the process, any kind of single process, took time, but with the, 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 the government wins, hopefully everything will be fine.
yeah, that is it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Another country in the region where there's a lot happening, a lot of good stuff. They did not begin with BRT planning, given the size of the country, but government has been consistent. The city of Kigali is in charge. They have a future plan. They have a forward looking plan for Kigali. Uh, I don't know what you've posted on the chat for Vedaste in terms of uh, questions and comments, but uh, thank you. We are very, very encouraged by this approach. We do not need to start where Bogota began. Please refer to the document that ITDP has shared uh, for more on Kigali. And thank you, Vedaste, for that very good, good, good presentation. Very clear, very optimistic. And we hope that the rest of us uh, can learn. I will uh, allow people to just answer this one question. What is the size of the Matatu operations compared to the three operators? Uh, can you see that question? I think, uh, again, I may not interpret it as well, but I think the person is asking the Matatus that did not join these operations in your country, how big is that operation compared to the three bus companies that moved into higher capacity buses? Vedaste? Yes, yes, I'll have come back. I, I, I have some disruption, sorry. Hi, Lahab, could you repeat the question? I don't get you very well. I get disruption, the, sorry. The question she's asking you, mm -hmm. Kigali set up three bus operators mm -hmm. and definitely not everyone joined the three companies. You had some of your smaller mm -hmm. vehicles still left operating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how big is that operation of the taxi, the 14, 18 seater that was there before? Is it still mm -hmm. operating? Were they phased off? Are they growing? Mm -hmm. Have they reduced? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Honestly, the answer, they, they reduced a lot. Honestly, now they're about to finish. What happened is for the trunk load, send the, the, the company United, they used to, to, to import because some, some waivers have been provided to import the buses with high capacities. And the government, through the Matron Steering Committee, keep like advising the operators to, in, to import the bigger buses. Then what happened, those slowly by slowly those, you see, if I could count it, it's a journal of seven to eight years. Then what happened is those, those, those small buses, nowadays they are not working in the city, to be honest with you. They are working with the intercity services. Yeah, that, that, that what happened. You see there are some of them, I, I can get some of them, they come order and order, and the existing one, they're they are working for the countryside services not in the city one. Thank you. Rahab, uh, can allow, I, uh, allow me, sorry, Chris. Sorry, um, yeah, can I just jump in with the clarification? So I think the question's also about whether there are any operators who are still running informally alongside these three big entities. So Vedast, is that the case? Or, because my understanding was that there, there are no other operators, like all the services in the city are provided by those three big entities. Is that right? Yeah, yeah you are right. There is no other one. There is no informal kind of operators who are still operating on those. 
provided load. Actually, what happened, the, the city has been subdivided into four transport zone and it one big operator the one names as ala ftc the the the, the association the U united association they are now operating two zones and one kbs is operating the remaining one is and the other one known as loyal express is operating the other one and with the inspection from the government no any informal operator who could be able to provide those kind of informal services. Thanks. Thank you, Chris, for that clarification. And thank you, Vedaste. Uh, Dixon Bogua, have you been able to connect? Dixon? Uh, we would have loved to hear from Dixon because definitely something is happening with the Matatu operators in Nairobi. I am well aware we have the government that formed a task force two years ago that has been working towards uh, bringing in the private sector operators. Uh, Dixon, have you unmuted? People are telling me you need to unmute. I don't want to give the story, but I'm now seeing as needing to move to the next presentation. Dixon, please. Okay. My email address is lindsay.abuya, L I N D. Uh, I'm afraid I will move us now to the next presentation. Between Penina and Maina, we don't want to take too long, but we want to capture the main issues around TOD planning. Maina, would you like to continue with what you gave us yesterday or have you talked to Penina and how are you handling the session? So am I the one? Can you hear me? Yes, Rehab, I can hear you. I've not heard anything from Maina. Please present. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'm Penina Ndegwa, I'm from ITDP, and I'll be taking you through the TOD session, which is, um, give me a second, I share my screen. Yeah, so I'll just be taking you through the integration of urban transportation and land use planning, and basically introduce the concept of TOD, uh, which is transit oriented development, to see how we can link the two uh, levels of planning to achieve sustainable cities. Um, I just wanted to start with uh, sharing a speak or a Google map image on how Thika Road was before the Thika Road itself was upgraded to the lanes we have right now. And so this was before, and now this is how it is right now. Um, and so what has been happening is that the moment the road was constructed, it attracted a lot of development along the road. And in fact, if you drive um, from Nairobi to Fika, you would hardly even tell the estates that you are in if you're not very uh, a frequent visitor of that side of the road. But then the main question is, as development is happening, is it actually sustainable? Is it um, developing in a way that it's supporting the transport system that is being planned? And so what happened when people moved, a lot of people moved along the car road, uh, they did not move or rather the planning did not take care of the other needs uh, in terms of employment opportunities, in terms of uh, schools, hospitals, and you know the things that people need to access every other day. And for that reason, people still have to commute uh, from their homes along Thika Road coming to the CBD. And that's where you can see a lot of traffic congestion because more people moved, but then the services, or rather the other needs were not catered for along the corridor. 
And so what happened, even if the road was expanded, there's just no way uh, the congestion is going to end. And this becomes a vicious cycle and we cannot uh, continue uh, working like that. So I'm really happy that uh, at least uh, Namata and the government is now planning the BRT corridors. And of course, you know, Thika Road is one of them. And I know you've been here in the sessions that you've had and you've seen uh, some of the proposals uh, that are now coming up. But then also thinking, having the BRT corridor along Thika Road, is it going to uh, link or is it just having the BRT corridor linking with the land uses uh, that, uh, or is it connecting um, the land uses adjacent to the BRT corridor. This is an example of Johannesburg. This is um, a BRT station, but then you can see some residential apartment on this other side. And because they're not connected, uh, this, you can see there's a boundary wall. So the people who live here are not actually able to access directly to the station. And so that means that it is just having a BRT next to um, as a land use or along your corridor, it may not, you may not necessarily be connected. And so what we always advocate for is now having the two land use and uh, transport modes being integrated to ensure that uh, more people are able to access transport services and also live near the transport services. So give me a second, I need to move this here. Okay, yeah. So basically the concept of TOD, uh, it introduces uh, eight basic principles. They are divided, I like to divide them into two uh, major sections. So one on mobility and the other one on urban form. So when it comes to mobility, we look at walking, we look at cycling, we look at transit. Uh, we also look at street connectivity or street network. Then uh, on the other side of urban structure, we look at now having compact development, having density, high density development, having mixed use and also shift, which I'll also now be highlighting a few of those uh, examples as we go along. Um, okay. So look, starting with walking, I, I know this is very familiar. Uh, we've not provided uh, how we've designed our transport systems. We've not catered for the majority of the people who are pedestrians. Uh, we've seen uh, very good expensive carriageways. This is especially Thika Road, which is one of the most expensive highways we have in the country. At the same time, it has not catered for something that is so easy to implement like an NMT network. Uh, where they have maybe tried to provide that, they, you'll see a lot of obstruction, maybe from uh, utility poles and all that. And you'll see a lot of pedestrians uh, crossing or using the street or the carriage of conflict with, uh, with pedestrians. And so we cannot continue like that. We need to start in thinking of how we can implement sustainable uh, working infrastructure. And this is an example of how Kisumu has done it expanding the pedestrian realm so that pedestrians can now be able to access services and facilities and destination by just walking and not just walking but walking on safe spaces that doesn't have to expose them on the risk of accidents. On the other side, uh, it's very important as we design our NMT infrastructure to ensure that we provide uh, street furniture, number one, to ensure that people can actually enjoy just being on the street. That is just not a matter of you walking there and accessing the services, that you can go and hang out on the street, you can meet a friend, you can wait for a friend, and you have quality sitting in uh, facilities like good benches. We also have um, introduced uh, waste bins to ensure that we can be able to keep our streets very clean and also ensuring that we maintain our tree cover so that it can provide shade and also act as a carbon sink. And we also have to avoid boundary walls because what happens when you provide a lot of boundary walls, there's no connection between the pedestrians walking on the street and the people inside the building. So imagine yourself walking on such a space. This is Nairobi, one of the uh, newest building uh, along the remote road. And as you can see, it's not even comfortable. I don't know how you would feel walking there at night. You know, it's, there's nobody watching over you. And so what we, uh, another example is... Um, and you know, is uh, what? Sorry, I don't know that you can, okay, fine, thank you. So another bad example of sometimes how we provide or how we lack that connectivity between and working facilities for pedestrians is also providing a lot of parking silos or off-street parking in buildings. And that way there's no, if you're using this space, again, remember now people are occupying from like the third floor. 
So no one is really seeing you walking here as a pedestrian. And again, even if the, 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 the boundary walls is a bit um, transparent, at least you can be able to see through. Nobody, there are no activities on the ground floor making you feel enticed and protected to walk. So what you need to do, you need to ensure that you have active frontages. An active frontages means that you have more eyes on the street. You have people and activities overlooking the street. And it's just not, not, not only make the street uh, comfortable, it also makes it vibrant, even past uh, working hours. And again, some, you're doing some of the good. Uh, at least this is Mombasa. You can see a lot of uh, businesses on the, on the street. Again, with multiple entrances. So that make it safer and more inviting to walk across. And so the, we need to start thinking about this aspect, even as we design our BRT corridors, to ensure that, especially around the stations, that you can be able to provide uh, diverse activities, that the facades are active, and you can even provide iteraries. I know Mombasa is working on such a project, and I know at the end of the day, we can be able to achieve um, quality uh, active frontages. Then going to cycling, we have also not uh, done very well somehow in providing cycling infrastructure across the city. And like Chris mentioned, and I think throughout this whole seminar uh, conference we've had about being able to access the BRT station by cycling and walking. Yeah? So if you do not provide safe uh, cycling infrastructure from homes to uh, maybe the, the transport corridor to access a BRT station, then people are not going to actually cycle to access the public transport system. And that is just a turn off and somebody will just maybe opt to use a private car instead of cycling. But again, we're also doing some good. Uh, this is Gong Road, a very good uh, cycling uh, facility, but again, it is not continuous and it is not connected. We need to ensure that this is something that is accessible across the city. And so actually some of providing some of these things doesn't have to be expensive. You can just do simple retrofits using like uh, flower, pot, um, flower pots. Uh, this is Kisumu again. Again, this did not last for long, uh, but I think we don't have to really say that this is an expensive affair. Uh, we've seen that uh, in other cities like Paris during COVID-19 where they reclaimed using tactical urbanism to reclaim some of the carriageways space to allocate uh, that space for pedestrians. And now going to street network, um, we have to ensure that as we plan our land uses, we ensure that uh, streets are well interconnected. And how, how we achieve that is ensuring that it's easier for you to cycle and walk than it is for you to drive. So if you look at the image on the <laughs> this is left, I always have that problem of right and left anyway. So th this, it's, if you're maybe in a point at the end here, you, there's no net connectivity uh, between you and accessing maybe a major arterial. So what that means, it will be easier for you to walk or cycle. I mean, it will be easy, harder for you to walk or cycle than it is for you to take a, uh, a vehicle. And maybe bring it closer home. If you've been to Upper Hill, um, maybe you know the avenues, the, uh, the first, second, all those avenues. We did a survey sometime back in 2019 and we found out that the walking distance like from one, maybe from uh, the main road to the other side, they are longer, the blocks are very long, they are like 400 meters. So for you to go to the, uh, to access a service on the next street, you have to like walk longer than you would have if you had some at least pedestrian access uh, point. And that's why we need to change that to ensure that our, when we do our planning of land uses, we ensure that we provide quality street network so that people are able to um, access. And now going back to a very common phenomenon in Nairobi where we provide a lot of gated communities. Um, I know this looks cool. Uh, everyone wants to live in a nice uh, suburb, but then what happens? Some of these, uh, and actually most of them, most of these gated communities, you'll find that they're not, first of all, mixed use. They're not mixed use. You'll not get a kindergarten, you'll not get a public space, you'll not get shopping areas. So what does that mean? One has to, it's more car oriented. One has to go, first of all, from where they live, going to maybe another location to access uh, facilities, you know, like shopping areas and all that. And then again, the street network is not integrated. As they plan these small gated communities, they, there's minimal integration with them. The, the street network is not um, harmonized because again, you, 
In most instances, you will see that even public transport is not able to access. And so it becomes very car centric, you know? So we need to change uh, that kind of phenomenon. And now also going around the BRT stations, for example, this has been prechoired. And um, as you can see, we have quite a good density in the area, like, uh, but then also how many people are able to access the BRT stations. If you look at this next image, how many people are actually through the street network, how it's connected, how many people can be able to access the station within five minutes? It's, it reduces if you can compare that, if you did a buffer zone, a buffer of 400 meters, which is something that will take you like four or five minutes walking to access the station, you realize that the people who can actually access is less. And that's because you have poor street network uh, along the corridor. So we need to change that. And um, basically we have to ensure that at least a lot, after just providing the major arterials and collector streets, we will now provide pedestrian passengers that are exclusive for pedestrian and cyclists to access. And uh, this is another one uh, in Singapore where they have, you can see they have put some bollards here and uh, that means the vehicles are not allowed to enter and no pedestrian can easily cross over and continue walking. And now the vehicles can, you know, use the longer route to access. And that way is just a turn off for pedestrian. You're like, you'd rather walk, it's fun. And you can see people even meeting on the street and it makes um, cities more sustainable. And now going back again, uh, talking about uh, street network and how we can do this uh, when you're making our land use plans. This is Ahmedabad. And uh, as you can see, this is how street network used to look like um, before they made the new plan. And so the, at least a block, one block of a street was approximately 743 meters. And they changed that uh, by in now introducing other streets within the existing uh, plans. And that way now they were able to reduce from over 700 meters to at least 400 meters. Again, that make it easier for pedestrians to walk and cycle and it just make it easier for you to walk them. You don't really necessarily have to need a car to drive there because you can access. And now of course, going back to how do we actually achieve that? Like now for Upper Hill, I told you we have, we have like, um, the blocks are long and now it's maybe be, maybe necessary for you to start introducing um, past pedestrian passageways. How do you achieve that? You can give incentives to developers. For example, if you provide uh, pedestrian passageways, maybe you say three, four meters, then we can be able to allow you to go some extra floors higher than the normal zoning regulation. That way then we're able to achieve a bit of street network that provide shorter and more direct routes for for pedestrians. And also when it goes to the planning process, we don't need to just go, uh, just, we need to go beyond the regulations, you know, the zoning regulations. We need to clearly define the building line, define where the, how their kids are supposed to be. Remember, we, we have to say no to the boundary walls, for example, because we have seen how, how it makes working unfriendly and all that uh, kind of scenario. I avoided putting a lot of uh, going so much into T BRT because you've heard a lot about BRT, but I wanted to share this slide on how you can ensure that BRT and land um, leverages from the land use. So this is, uh, this is Krutiba and along the BRT corridor, they changed the zoning regulation to ensure to allow high intensity development along their B BRT corridors. As you can see, we have the density is beyond, it's, you create a, like a TOD zone, uh, which is maybe say 500 meters on either side of the BRT corridor. And then you have like special zoning. You allow special different zoning regulation as opposed to the other sides, uh, other parts of the city. That way, then now you're able to ensure that more people are actually living near the BRT corridor. And it increases ridership, and that even make a business case, even for the BRT station. But then if you only promote low density along this area, for example, as you can see in the other sections, uh, the other sides uh, that are beyond the TOD zone, if that was the same zoning regulation that was used for this area, then we'd be having very few people living there, and then you'll be having less people riding the BRT. And that means you have to increase the subsidies that Engineer Jerry was talking about. And you know, it would just make BRT very unsustainable. So just having more people live near the BRT corridors is good for BRT system. And if you look at now Nairobi, how it is, you can see low density along most of our BRT corridors uh, where they're passing through, it's actually low density. And we cannot continue like that. I think we need to start thinking ahead 
we number one like to increase the ridership. We have to ensure that more people are living near the BRT stations. This proper street network that people can access. So we have to change this, and we have time. And it, we don't have so much time left. We have a window of opportunity for us to just change or create a TOD zone along all the BRT corridors to bring more people live and work and play and access facilities and services along the BRT corridors. And um, this again, another example, you can see along the BRT corridors, the density is different, they have different zoning regulation. And basically this is what we are now talking about, ensuring that we have compact development. It's, you know, we have to intensify it. If you have vacant plots, um, along the BRT corridor, maybe now the government is time to maybe start uh, introducing tax um, on property owners. You know, some people just hold that land for speculation that now BRT is coming and the, my property is going to go higher, so I don't want to develop it. But actually now that's even what causes urban sprawl. And to curb that, we have to ensure that we take advantage of existing built areas to intensify it, to ensure that it is more compact, it is more dense, to bring more people, uh, to allow more people to live within a very uh, small space. And another important aspect, you don't need to develop, you know, single use development, because like I mentioned when I was saying in the slide of the gated communities, you have to go, you have to access services, you have to go to the shops, you have to go to, you know, to school and all that. We need to ensure that we provide mixed use development, let there be some few shops and coffee shops on the ground floors, and then people can live, uh, in the upper floors, that way you even have sort of 24 hours occupancy. And I like to give this example of Upper Hill. If you go to Upper Hill in the morning, it's a very, it's congested. There's a lot of traffic smaller because everyone is going to work. If you walk there past 6.30, it's a ghost town. Everybody has gone home and it's silent. I don't even think cafes are even able to make any sales past that hour because people are not there. But then if you make it mixed, if you have some people living there, then a city would be more vibrant. And that can actually be one way of achieving 24 hour economy. And now, of course, this is now, uh, like I was saying, some of these things has to have to be in the master plans. This is where the physical planners need to really come in. And this is, for example, this is Kigali. Um, they, through their now current master plan uh, that is supposed to oversee development in the next almost 30 years from now, they have ensured that the, wherever they are proposing to have a BRT lines, they are ensuring that the zoning regulations are, allow high density development. And then again, if you, if you are developing there and then you provide uh, affordable housing, then you have you get some incentives. You are able to, you get some extra FAR if you are able to, you know, provide affordable housing. Because again, we must we cannot be blind to the fact that we we are developing cities that are not affordable to majority of the people. So how can we make sure that a young person who just graduated can actually live in Upper Hill? Can we provide affordable housing within the very expensive uh, residential units there? And somehow we've kind of achieved high density, mixed use development in some of our areas. But then again, you'll always lack something. It's not accessible by walking, cycling, and all that. So we need to ensure that happens. So this is a new building that is coming up in Upper Hill. And uh, what is interesting about this building um, is the number of floors, for example, it has provided for parking. Again, it's very, it's a very high end uh, development and it's actually located along a BRT line. So why would you allow parking provision, like five floors of parking in such a building that is just next to the BRT station, you know, a future BRT station, or rather close as in approximately, uh, I mean, um, a close distance to, like a walking distance from a, BRT, a future BRT station. So we need to be making some of those deliberate uh, decisions. That's why I said we have a window of opportunity, but if we mess up right now, we may not be able to rectify it. So such a building, if you are futuristic, would maybe have allowed maybe one floor for affordable housing and maybe reduce the number of parking spaces because we have the future, is BRT and now people living there can actually be able to use public transport system. And so another thing that you're also doing is now to ensure that we harmonize uh, plans that are coming up to ensure that, you know, they are aligned to TOD and they are cognizant of the BRT corridors. For example, for Kisumu, uh, they are also in the process of making an LP, LUDP, a physical plan, uh, land use and phys um, 
local physical and land use plan that is supposed to get them for the next uh, 20 years. And so uh, we also prepared a sustainable mobility plan for the city that's supposed to guide them for the next 10 years. So what we've been doing is now integrate the two plans to ensure that where we are having high dense, uh, we are still in consultation. It's not something that is already done, but basically a proposal is to ensure that along the public transport corridors, our zoning is different. Our our regulations are different so that now we can have high intensity compact development mixed uses along the public transport corridors and compact development like i mentioned a little earlier it's basically taking advantage of uh, all the vacant plots uh, we've seen there's a lot of speculation in this country you'll see a lot of people you know just taking up uh, space or holding on to their plots without developing or you'll now see let me just use upper hill because i've studied upper hill um, maybe you have like a single dwelling unit and the neighbor there is the Britam Towers who is making more money and it's dense and all that. So how can we push private uh, property owners to develop? And because if you don't do this, then we have to, there will be no land available for development and city, the cities will continue to sprawl. So what we need to do is introduce maybe tax, tax incentives that even if you have not developed a plot or yours it is a single dwelling unit, you'll pay the same tax or land property tax as a person with a high density residential area or development or with a big commercial uh, development. That way, you either sell or develop, you know? And that's just a way of compelling, uh, ensuring that you have in field development. Again, this is Ahmedabad. Uh, they, when they're making their plan again back in 2002, they ensured that they're not going to expand beyond a specific boundary. And so all development had to be contained within the existing urban space. And that's why, uh, that's what I'm talking about, ensuring that you maximize the existing urban areas to ensure that you're not spreading out uh, to avoid urban sprawl. Then we also cannot ignore the informal settlements. You know, you have, we have quite a number in Kenya and uh, we have to redevelop them. I know like uh, Mungano and Vijiji have been working on the Mukuru uh, plan. And we have to maybe use special regulations because if you use the, the normal planning standards, it, we may not be able to you know, achieve a sustainable city. We may be, have a lot of relocations, a lot of evictions that may not be necessary and may disrupt livelihood. So we may need to actually uh, you know, come up with proper ways of upgrading us in form of settlements to ensure that more people are retained within the area. And at the same time, we are so upgrading to ensure that they access utilities like water, public transport systems, um, SIWA and all that to enable them to actually densify, to ensure that we have proper street network so that they are not excluded uh, from the city life. And now going to the last thing, which is very important to ensuring that uh, our cities are sustainable. We must also consider the parking management. Uh, I think the first session, the first day on Wednesday, I can't remember who presented, but um, there's that a concept of avoid, shift, and improve. If we continue providing more parking spaces, then we are we just don't maximize our urban areas. And it's a vicious cycle. Again, the more you provide, the higher the demand. And this is something that is proven scientifically. We cannot continue providing parking facilities thinking that we may need, you know, the, um, Expected to increase so many, uh, or rather, we are we are thinking of how many vehicles you have to provide because when we like now even for the zoning regulation, if we talk about uh, minimum parking requirement, we are thinking that that's the baseline. That's the baseline that we need to provide. But if you say maximum, then we are capping. We are saying okay, provide us a certain number of parking spaces, but only to this extent. And that now you're able to control uh, the amount of uh, spaces in our area cities from on street and also off street. And this is Copenhagen, this is how it was in the 50s. A lot of cars, you know, it was just cities and a lot of vehicles. And they changed that to just provide that for pedestrians. And um, yeah, I think it's more vibrant than it was. So basically parking is a way, reclaiming parking for the people is a way of bringing more people to the city. Again, this is another area. Uh, I think this is Kurotiba, if I'm not wrong. And um, you can see how, how many parkings were. And then they redesigned this to 
just parallel parking and then expanded pedestrian realm and they were able to expand uh, to make the city more vibrant and less congested, you know. And uh, again, how can you actually achieve this? I understand like parking is a lever, cities must make revenue out of uh, this, but then you have to also think of how to, you know, balance between getting the revenue and also solving the congestion. And so you can do that maybe by through hourly parking. Uh, and for example, in Nairobi, where instead of charging 200 shillings the whole day, you can now charge maybe one parking lot, maybe 20 shillings per hour. If you park there for eight hours, then the city will have gained uh, 20 shillings times 160, you know? And because the parking fee end up being high, if you park for long, there's always high turnover. And that way the city is able to make more income, at the same time reduce congestion in the city. And also now for off-street parking, uh, that I mentioned about um, the minimum parking requirement. So the, the regulations for Nairobi are that for 100 square meter uh, of, of commercial space, you provide one parking lot. So, and Britam Towers in Upper Hill is that 5,000 square meters. So if it was supposed to apply the standard that, uh, the planning standard that is provided, it would just have provided 350 parking lots. But what they have done, they have actually provided 1,000 parking lots. So what does that mean? They have ever provided. And if you go here, what happens? Because even providing, building these um, towers are not cheap. It's not cheap. So what happens is that the, the housing unit become very expensive because at the end of the day, the developer has to gain back their revenue out of you know, providing this parking infrastructure. So basically you will get a lot of vacancy. I remember back in 2019 when we had a TOD webinar uh, conference, uh, we got to know that Upper Hill only, to, it has an average of 25% occupancy. So why do we have very modern buildings but are not being occupied? It could be just because of this parking because it's not free. It makes housing expensive, rents are higher. So people are afraid of, you know, occupying some of those spaces. And at the end of the day, as a developer, you don't gain much from that. So we need to, to change uh, that. And most importantly, again, it's very close to our future BRT station. So clearly it may not be necessary to provide all that. And this is with rebuilding London, again, bigger than, the Britam Towers, but has only provided five parking lots and they're all for the disabled. I'm not saying that you have to go to this level, but maybe we need to change how we, we how much space we allocate for parking and that way we can make our cities more sustainable. Thank you. Oh, and finally, uh, thinking at the opportunity cost of parking, how much more can you do with this space? For example, uh, you can provide a dining space for so 15 people, that's a business place. You can provide an affordable housing, a studio for a student. And that makes more sense than just providing a parking lot, you know? And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Penina. Very clear, very insightful, thought provoking, especially when you show us Upper Hill and the kind of developments that are going on and the need for mixed use development as opposed to the real estates that we are putting up all over the place and encouraging urban sprawl. You've also brought in interesting comments about parking, uh, mixed land use. And again, I wish uh, Namata would respond if they have a plan around this area of TOD. It would be useful to hear because this workshop targets Namata and we were to interact around what is happening in Nairobi, bringing in other experiences from the region and elsewhere. So I don't know if Maina is still with us and you'd like to just give a response in a sentence to what we have had. Thank you very much, Penina. Thank you. Thank you, Reha. Um, uh, what Penina has presented is very insightful and uh, my position is that uh, we have not uh, within uh, our planning jurisdictions of uh, the five counties practice GOD uh, very consciously and currently most of the planning is based 
on uh, protest issues and uh, provisions for parking for buildings, which is usually mm -hmm. uh, very rigid within the county approving systems uh, government. So uh, what we are uh, in Namata trying to get into is to working with the county governments within the mm -hmm. designated uh, corridors for, and uh, I mean for BRT, so that we can have those areas, especially zoning areas, where we are going to allow high density development, as explained by Penina, as well as uh, look at avenues, probably where counties can further get uh, uh, new revenue streams. So these are things that we have not explored fully. And uh, this is what our line of thinking is. True, uh, true to that is our taxation base for property letting or the taxes that we get from prop, I mean, from property or revenue is mm -hmm. normally on uh, either lates or fees collected from, uh, or fees collected from, uh, the, I mean, uh, development permission or development certificate. That's uh, they are. They are basically the very traditional ones. The others are normally collected by the national government. However, our basis for rating system in Kenya is based on uh, uh, undeveloped site value, meaning the owner of Britam and the owner of somebody who has not developed his property in Upahi, they pay the same amount of uh, rates. So yes, all these are new things that we want to explore and we'll be working with our county government in order to bring them into space. The lucky thing is that uh, most of the countries have developed their uh, concept papers on uh, their radio plant, and this is where we want to log in. Thank you, Lahab. Thank you, Maina, for the intervention. We appreciate that at least Namata is thinking about it. I'm also conscious that if it takes too long on the table, the buildings will keep going up. Uh, so we need to accelerate some of that thinking, particularly for the Nairobi metropolitan area, so that we have a lot more mixed use development than has been the case. And then within the urban areas, some of the concepts that Penina has shared so that we don't miss the train on this one. Ideally, it should have been land use planning that speaks to uh, how we move people, how we develop our transport corridors. But that has not happened. At least you've given us some hope with regard uh, to Nairobi. Again, this is a topic that we can spend a lot of time on and I don't think we have that luxury, given that we are going towards one o'clock, but I see very interesting posts. Cities like London proudly and confidently deny you private parking facilities because of their mature public transport system. All our planning should progressively get us there with an iterated development. Again, someone saying London has done it, other places have done it, but you must work hand in hand with an improved public transport system, which is what we've been tackling. And we discovered in the last session, this is not a very easy thing to achieve. Uh, then there are questions. Are there existing national yeah, government so policies mm -hmm. to ensure that mm -hmm. towns like Nakuru, who want city status, are required to have county and regional level policies for TOD. I think Maina already said that TOD as a concept has not been embraced yet. We are still planning using the traditional planning regimes. Uh, there are many yeah. other good comments coming from people and we may not go through each one of us because Penina has pointed out on what needs to be done. Maina has told us it has not yet been done, uh, so we can't really discuss 
Nairobi in terms of implementation. I'm sure other cities in the region would have told us what they are doing around TOD. I'm aware in Dar es Salaam, as the government plans on BRT phase two, three and four, the World Bank is already supporting TOD studies. Uh, so there's a lot we can still learn from our neighbors. With us on call, we have Solomon Waidaka who was not able to join us yesterday. He's a seasoned highway engineer, but who has also transformed to a social engineer in his career. I don't want to say too much about him, but to invite him to give us his own insights. Solomon, you are involved in trying to help Namata, the government. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please Hello. take three minutes to give us your insights. We'll miss your long Please. presentation, but would like to give you a few minutes just to give us insights that we can reflect on. I know we do not have much time, uh, Rahab, and thank you very much. And uh, so I will try and skip a number of things. But first to say that it's been a very, very, very interesting three days, uh, uh, pro uh, th three days uh, discussion program. And uh, I appreciate the fact that we have about 130, 140 participants. Uh, that means we are increasingly getting many more people interested in the uh, public, uh, public, pu public uh, transport. Uh, area, particularly uh, as our cities are growing and growing and growing. I've seen uh, Kigali uh, transform in three uh, in, in five years. We are we are still behind them, even having started a little bit earlier than them. Uh, but I know there is still a, a lot of time. There's still a bit of time we can still catch up. I want to um, focus a little on, on areas that I have been asked to talk about earlier. I'll try and make it as short as possible. I've been involved in a, a BRT, I would almost say more than 10 years. Uh, we started the process in Dar es Salaam, and now it has been uh, implementation has been ongoing. Uh, they are already uh, operational on uh, one, of the main, one of the main corridors. Um, we started, we discussed in Kenya about, uh, yes, about 10 years now uh, to start uh, uh, the BRT. Uh, it has taken a lot of time, but now with the formation of Namata and uh, with the Ministry of Transport interested in implement implementing, I see we are already doing some work on uh, thicker road. Um, going diving directly straight, I'll talk about uh, uh, um, what's happening in Nairobi. We have five lines. Uh, these have been uh, explained um, um, uh, you know, in a lot of details. Uh, um, these are routes that were identified three, six, seven years ago, and they are still viable and they need to be implemented. Um, then we have Mombasa. Mombasa is a city uh, that we all know that needs uh, um, you know, good public transport, particularly going to the north coast and to the south coast. Uh, there is the, the main highway that being uh, uh, um, constructed by, I think it's Kenha, Mombasa towards Marie the Expressway. We definitely require a uh, public transport uh, uh, system in there. K uh, Kisumu, we have literally, uh, as ITDP, done some uh, mobility studies, identify the trees one BRT line. And uh, I think it's important that uh, they are interested and uh, it's important that we follow up on this. Other cities like Eldoret and Nakuru need to start looking seriously at public transport uh, because the uh, Matatus as they are now, are not viable as good moving forward. Now, um, I want to talk a little about, uh, uh, we've discussed about planning and all that, but I want to talk about a little about financing. Um, if we look at the uh, requirements, if we look at the financial requirement for uh, in one of these corridors, because in one of these corridor um, involves huge sums of money we need to seriously start thinking um, um, on financing because I've seen, for example, Thika Road has started, but you can see uh, the progress, uh, which may be, I think also reflects the, the cash flow. It's been slow. Um, we need to seriously think about financing. And uh, while, while we are talking about financing, there are a number of things that we need to uh, uh, think about. One of them is the, anybody wanting to finance 
would want to know that you have a clear right of way. Each corridor needs to have a clear, each route requires to have a, a clear right of way, which basically means that uh, as early as possible, it has to be identified and the uh, impediments along that route need to be sorted out. I mean, there are, there are many challenges and uh, uh, these challenges are, have to be, you know, um, you know the, the way they are, I can give an example of uh, uh, the construction of or the upgrading of uh, Waiyaki uh, to Lironi. Uh, I gather that the compensation for uh, compensation alone was more than the cost of the uh, rehabilitation or, or reconstruction that is uh, being done. So this is something we have to take into account considering the circumstances that we are in this country, where the constitution requires that uh, a uh, large tick be compensated fully. Um, then we, once we have identified the, 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 road, the, 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 the roads and the corridors, we need to carry out a full detailed feasibility. And this feasibility uh, obviously uh, it has, a, has an element of the technical side, the engineering side, we have to really look at the environmental impact and mitigation measures. Most important, the social impact assessment, where we will be talking about uh, persons that are going to be affected by the projects, properties that are going to be affected by the project, and these need to be identified early and be sorted out. The last one is, uh, is the financing side. You find that uh, once you've sorted out the technical, the environmental, the social, and you have a clear corridor, uh, somebody wanting to finance will be able to say, fine, then we can move in this direction. Um, and then I would wish to quickly uh, uh, mention a number of uh, sources of funding. Because of the nature of the project, I think GOK and the development partners, this is where we bring on both the development partners. And I know that uh, we had discussed a lot with development partners for the five corridors uh, in Nairobi. And uh, we had about four to five already uh, identified, identified with a number of uh, uh, development partners. This has quite changed now, uh, but uh, obviously uh, I think if, if one has got a bankable project based on what I just mentioned, the uh, clear light of way, the TO feasibility that indicates that the project is viable, it's possible to interest the development partners. But GOK also uh, um, has to spearhead this. And then one way of uh, uh, other ways that the development partners and government budget, they are also infrastructure bonds. Infrastructure bonds are quite useful, uh, particularly when they are long-term, you know, 10, 20 years, uh, they could be used for fi financing these kind of projects. And of course, they are always small grants that are basically used for the uh, softer side. Now, moving forward, uh, as part of the planning and preparation, it's important that once you start uh, or once you identify, once you determine the corridor and you, and you start the, the civil works, if I may call that, and the resettlement and all that, eh, you also do on the softer side, you start now identifying the operator because the operator is the one who will provide the, the rolling stock, preferably in our circumstances, a private sector operator. Uh, we've seen the examples of Nyao bars and other uh, publicly owned uh, um, um, transport systems. They don't quite work very well. So um, we need somebody who could actually provide uh, a ro the rolling stock. And you know, there's a lead time to having bus. If you want uh, 100, 200 buses on a corridor, then you need to, then, then you, there's need for lead time. And the lead time could be half or almost the same time as it requires to um, construct the corridor. Um, they are obviously the, the, the provider, the person who provides the infrastructure. Usually it's uh, the owner of the infrastructure. In Tanzania, we, for, we asked the, uh, the Tanzania town roads to actually do the actual construction because they have the expertise and they have the experience and they have the manpower. In our circumstances, we'll be looking at uh, Ken Hakura and obviously all, of, all that work is provided by uh, Namata. Uh, the infrastructure owner or the the, the, the the owner of the whole BRT, I think we are, we are in agreement. Hello. Uh, we are we are in agreement that uh, uh, the infrastructure um, means uh, the infrastructure owner is Namata. Um, 
the infrastructure will require to be maintained. So even as we give contract, even as we uh, start operations, we require to have somebody on the ground at the same time doing the uh, maintenance of the uh, of the of the um, of the infrastructure. I've seen. I think it was in, a, in a, it was in where it was in country in South South America where after buses started operating because they were using flexible pavements, it started rotting, rotting very badly and required uh, somebody on site to actually fix that and fix it, uh, fix it uh, um, as early as possible. In a manner of speaking, I'm saying that uh, even as we look at the financing, we look at the uh, development of infrastructure, on the operational side, we need to identify the operator and, and the, the fare collector and the fund manager. I think this uh, was mentioned by Chigali when they were discussing about uh, there are three roads, the fare collector, and uh, obviously a fund manager, somebody who actually gets all the money. This is an area that uh, um, I think needs to be given a lot of attention because the more I hear, I hear a lot about infrastructure planning and all that, uh, we need now to focus a lot on the operations because this is where um, um, things can go extremely wrong. You could have an, an infrastructure done and you have no buses, or you could have an operation starting and then it becomes uh, a big problem. You know, it, it becomes a bigger problem than what you have. Then we would need a transition in respect of operations and the overall preparedness of the industry. This was part of the discussion that was to be presented, I think, by Dixon. This is critical in our, uh, in our uh, uh, affair operations in this country uh, to prepare the industry to be able to take up the operations. And, you know, having said that, I remember uh, having a discussion with one of the biggest operators then, five years back, um, 3M, I think they were called, and they were saying, all we are waiting is to be told what it is that the, the government needs, then we shall, uh, uh, you know, get rid of the small buses and bring the big ones and operate. In other words, there is a, the private sector just wants to be directed and guided, and then they'll be able to move quickly and uh, adopt to the circumstances. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a transition process, but uh, it's something that uh, requires to be started. Uh, started uh, started early so that by the time you are doing the infrastructure, you are looking for the operator, you are asking various people to come together to form companies uh, that can be able to, um, you know, um, uh, operate. Um, one of the things we have to avoid, and that's why I talked about a clear right of way early, identification of uh, right of ways, and in this case, if it's uh, the five routes we are talking about in the country, in, in, in Nairobi, for example, we need to be able to say, uh, this is the corridor. Uh, whatever development is going to be done here, it requires to include uh, BRT because these decisions have been made. We don't want to do like has happened on the Gong Road, where it's one of the um, um, it's one of the corridors that was identified for BRT, but uh, because there was uh, money available immediately and the matter had not been formed with all those other issues, uh, the road the road. Uh, uh, the highway people just went ahead and put up uh, a beautiful highway, but uh, it has a lot of uh, shortcomings. Uh, some of them have been mentioned in comments here, cycle lanes, you know, closings, no BRT facility that has been provided for it. Though I hear there is a corridor for it. So we do not want to do retrofitting. Again, it's, again, uh, Ica Road is a, you know, is a good example. And every time I drive on that road, I'm worried, I'm quite worried about uh, what I see a station being built. Um, we are retrofitting and retrofitting becomes quite a challenge, a big challenge on an existing uh, corridor. So let us not avoid this kind of retrofitting on the other um, uh, four corridors that we'll be dealing in Nairobi or the one that we are proposing for Mombasa or Kisumu. Um, going forward, there is also a survey. I think we need to uh, clearly think about uh, public transport as it is today. I think the policies like the one that I had uh, uh, we've been implementing in Chigali are extremely important. Uh, we need to really work on the, start thinking public transport. By the way, you know, when we talk about public transport and I had a, um, uh, 
Penina talking about this, one of the, one of the main uh, objectives of uh, a BRT or a good public transport system is dispersal, dispersal of the population. So that if I want to go and live in a, a Thika, I know I can get out, uh, park my car, get into a good public transport and come to the city. So I don't have to live in Napa Hill, even if I work there. I can live in Thika, I can live in Machakos, I can live in uh, Kitengela because there's a good public transport. I'll be able to park, get into my public transport and come to work the, if I'm working in the central business district and then get back. So that uh, business of uh, that thing called uh, uh, dispersal is extremely, extremely important when you have a good public transport. You've seen this in the cities like uh, London, um, uh, even in the US, in Washington, you have people are able to get out because there's good public transport. Um, now, the, the last and most important thing I wanted to mention here, it's something that, uh, you know, I know there are uh, ministry people perhaps on the, on the line. My good friend, uh, uh, Engineer Gitao is probably on the line. Uh, I think we do need to uh, really, really put a lot of uh, uh, resources in building the capacity of uh, Namata to implement because it has a board, it has a skeleton staff, but uh, we need to have uh, clear departments, uh, planning, you know, engineering, uh, you know, that are able to um, help with the overall planning because we are looking at um, uh, Nairobi, about three to four million, Nairobi metropolitan, about five million people. Uh, moving these people up and down requires quite a bit of a strategy. The private sector has been doing it and uh, uh, not, so, not so well, but we do need to have, if you want to have a more organized, a more uh, regularized system, we need to build the capacity of Namata to look at all these things. And particularly, when most important, is to implement the BRT routes in the city um, as planned. We mentioned the same thing when we were in Kisumu with the ITDP team, that uh, uh, even as they uh, implement the mobilization, the mobility plan that has been prepared, uh, they need to seriously think of uh, uh, somebody who overlooks the implementation and uh, somebody with capacity and when I see somebody, I don't mean an individual. I mean uh, an organized, some kind of an organized uh, uh, secretariat or, or team that actually looks at, at this thing uh, on the, uh, you know, with, with, with the, with, with the um, uh, for the long haul, as it were. And the capacity and capacity and capacity is important. And a matter needs money, needs resources. Um, I know that they can be able uh, with the life strategies to obtain substantial support from uh, development partners. Uh, it's an area that's important that they need to work to, to get. But in the, uh, while, while, while I say we also think that government uh, should provide, uh, um, you know, sufficient money so that they are able to engage the kind of, uh, the kind of quality of staff that will help uh, implement the BRT. So 10 years down the road, we are here. We, are, we started implementation on Thika Road. Uh, it's time to build now. It's time to move forward. I don't think we can hold anymore. Uh, I think we have uh, um, the you know critical capacity that we need now to 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 start implementing. Uh, we have the people. Uh, it's a question of deploying them and getting this done. So thank you very much, Rehab. I probably took a little longer, but uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Solomon, we needed to hear that. We needed to hear those insights because we've been asking through the sessions, how do we finance the BRTs? Uh, what is going wrong with Namata? Where can we correct? And you've given us enough to work with if you are to move forward. Uh, we appreciate those comments. And I believe Namata is listening. We also have a lot of students and young people on the call who are trying to understand the journey of the BRT, and I'm sure they have benefited from your insights. Thank you very much. Anybody wishing to uh, get a little more information, they can call me, we can speak. Thank you, Solomon. And Solomon is a board member of ITDP, so that also strengthens some of the things that he's saying. He can now engage government from uh, a different perspective 
but with hindsight, knowledge around Nairobi and the other cities that are working. Um, we want to recognize the presence of engineer Kidenda. He's the chairman of ITDP board. And uh, it is good to have Africans who have been in government helping us appreciate and understand the role of public transport. Engineer Kidenda, if you are there, please greet the people. Uh, thank you, thank you, Rehab. And uh, let me start by correcting that Solomon is actually our chair <laughs> at, the, at, at IT, ITDP. I am on the board with him. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, the team at ITDP, Solomon, Chris, uh, Jerry, and Penina, and the others. I think uh, uh, the knowledge shared over the three days uh, is useful to all of us. Uh, I've been sitting and uh, trying to absorb all the information coming through, and it's quite interesting. Uh, I liked uh, the story of Kigali. Uh, it shows that you can uh, move what you have into the next level and continue to develop it. And I think there was a lot of emphasis even in Jerry's presentation today that uh, the people are on the ground, the providers currently need to be considered and to be taken on board. Uh, uh, Penina, uh, that was uh, thought provoking and uh, I wonder, do we, do we call a halt to the plans we've had which have missed the mark? But uh, I said, no, if the train is moving, maybe we need to adjust as we move on. I would like to probably appeal, I know we have ministries, departments and agencies in here as well, that uh, there's a lot of work which has been done over the last 10 years. I remember in my earlier life, I did participate in some of this work. And uh, we need now to move to the next step. I think Solomon has also alluded to that. And uh, there needs to be a better coordination. Maybe Namata needs to have the capacity Solomon is talking about. But if there are corridors already identified and there is upgrading coming on, I want to suggest and suggest very strongly that the corridors which are already defined should be preserved. We may not have the funds to put in the BRTs today, but we should preserve them so that we avoid the retrofits. Uh, a good example is uh, what has been mentioned on uh, Gong Road, for example. If we come to reorganize that new construction to start uh, putting BRT in the middle, I think it will be a challenge or it will look wasteful, but we could have achieved that project by putting the two carriageways apart and leaving the BRT in the middle. But I said, yes, uh, maybe the coordination needs to be improved so that the other four corridors which are there, we do leave that right of way for the BRT so that what we'll worry about is uh, the construction and not trying to reacquire or to demolish what has already been done. Uh, so that is uh, now a matter you are in a coordinating role. We hope that uh, that will be able to be done. Uh, I want to say that, yes, it is true, the other uh, towns are also aspiring to do things. And Nairobi would be a good place for them to come and benchmark, because that's a Kenyan uh, uh, occupation. People like benchmarking. So if Namata can move fast, then the others can have something to look at. But let's also look at what the others are doing. I think the pictures from Kisumu indicate that there is something good happening there. And we can borrow and we can uh, replicate what is already happening in uh, our cities. Uh, 
Chris presented on uh, day one a very detailed uh, document, and that's a document which I would want to believe should be made available to all the MDS and even uh, the private developers. If somebody is doing Britain Tower, are they aware that there's a DRT station coming in 700 meters away from them? Is this, pub, is this information in public domain so that as they plan their architects and their ESI guys, they have an idea and know about this? So what I would want to suggest is, since the corridors have been earmarked and the possible stations are known, this information should be there even with the approving authorities within the uh, county government so that uh, as they approve, as they receive uh, uh, development plans, they can uh, uh, advise and take that into account. Uh, finally, I think I would want to mention rehab. I think uh, you've done a good job. You've steered this uh, uh, meetings very, very well. Uh, it's been very engaging. I like the idea of uh, having quick uh, uh, polls in between. You are able to find out how we are moving and what we are thinking about. I think it's, it was well organized, it's well done, and I wish to congratulate everybody who has been involved. Thank you very much uh, for participating. I think the numbers uh, speak for themselves. Let's continue to get more, let's organize more interaction uh, even into specifics, if there's uh, the ongoing corridor, maybe we can have one day where we just look at that particular corridor and see the challenges and what we've seen questions about people talking on safety and what have you. So we could organize uh, such a meeting to be specific to look at some uh, ongoing corridor work. Otherwise, thank you very much and God bless you all and uh, I've enjoyed the sessions. Thank you, engineer. I think because in Kisumu you are talking on behalf of ITDP, I assumed you are the chair, but uh, now I know that my old friend Solomon is the chairman of ITDP and you are a member. Uh, Emmanuel, is your mic on? Please switch it off. I would like us to give a minute to Namata, you know, this was capacity building for Namata. And we've listened to James Minor respond to a lot of issues around Namata. Do we have any other colleague from Namata? I just want them to briefly share with us what their take home is from these three days. Uh, last time we had engineer Chwele, I don't know if Abigail is still on the call. Is Namata in the house? Except Maina. All right, uh, silence means they may not be there. It would have been good to just get one takeaway because this was targeting capacity building for Namata, but I'm confident we have built capacity beyond uh, Namata. I have had a lot of side chats with people who have directed their concerns and their excitement and their downtimes to me. Uh, that was also very good. And it seems that I don't have that volunteer from Namata. Again, allow me to thank James Miner for standing up and feeding us with good developments on what Namata is doing. Thank you for stepping in. Uh, like Engineer Kidenda says, we are looking forward to a session where we'll lay down the plans and scrutinize critically what is happening on BRT line two, what do we think should be done. Again, it's unfortunate Dixon Bugwa was not able to connect to tell us what the operators are doing with government. So we also need to have that in future. 
And I'm told engineer Jonge from Namata wants to say something. Engineer, we've missed your presentation. We cannot receive it now, but do give us one or two takeaways for Namata from this session. Thank you. I'm sure I read Jonge, but maybe he's unable to connect. Uh, it's way past our closing time. I see a hand from Emmanuel Bikwa. Please make your intervention in the shortest time possible. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Madam uh, Rehab. Uh, this is Wini. Uh, Take away from Namata. We are very grateful for this forum. We have learned a lot. And as we're implementing the VIT line two, we are optimistic that we'll implement all the suggestions and proposals from the members. Of course, as a pilot, we are facing challenges. But before Corona, we had tried to have a series of stakeholder engagements that uh, proved to be very beneficial to us. Uh, issues that we had not seen before were able to brought them to the light by mostly the urban planners, the ITDB people, and we are very uh, uh, excited uh, that once we kick it off again, uh, the issue of communication has been raised a lot, that there's not much communication from our end, but we want to assure the public and you members that we are trying as fast as possible to uh, to communicate what we have, what is on the ground, and what we are doing. So just give us time. And with due time, as we are implementing and uh, as the infrastructure is uh, taking shape, I'm sure more of this information will come to light. And for the ITD people, we thank you so much for standing with us and for working with us and for all the help that you offer us. We couldn't have made this far without your help. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. Hilary, quickly. Uh, thank you uh, for, the, for the opportunity. I just wanted to shout uh, the, uh, my institution. I'm Hilary from Ponza Technopolis Development Authority, and we've been keenly following up on the presentations. And uh, part of what has been discussed really uh, affects our work because we are also building a city. And we're trying to incorporate the best ideas of uh, workability, uh, that is the NMT, and also planning and the BRT systems. So mine is to also request that uh, next time you organize such like forums, please don't forget concert in the police. And we also wish to be part and parcel of your work going forward. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Hilary. Uh, thank you for attending. We send the invitation through social media through other uh, platforms, feel free. And if you have specific ITB. requests that you'd like us to okay, attend to. Work. And also to appreciate the presentation by P9. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Hilary. Yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. We are encouraged to know that Namata has picked up a number of things by way of improving on how they've been communicating. Uh, the rest of us must have learned a lot. One of the takeaways for me is that the public transport industry transition is an area that needs very, very dedicated discussion with experts to help us navigate some of the intricacies that were, that were given to us briefly by engineer Jerry. And that's something we'll take forward from this session. Uh, we now have the final comment from my old friend, engineer Benson Jenga, the director of UDD, who will uh, speak on behalf of government. And before he comes on board, if I don't say anything, from you and Habitat. Yes, how are you? Fine, thank you. This is Nzioka, National Gender and Equality Commission. Nzioka. 
Yes, from National Gender and Equality Commission of Kenya. Yes. Yes, I want me to make a, a comment. Just uh, one one minute also. All right. So let me say thank, that I would like to thank Namata and other partners who have um, prepared this workshop. And uh, mine is to commend all the presenters who talked about the vulnerable groups, persons with disabilities, women, uh, older persons, and those persons who need attention during the construction and the development of these projects. Therefore, it's important that the commission appreciates this good effort. The National Gender Equality Commission, in partnership with the UN Habitat, ITDP and other organizations, we did a, a good study on uh, how we can include these vulnerable groups in these uh, projects. Therefore, it's my kind request that uh, we include our recommendations, which I know the UN Habitat has the report and other stakeholders. We can share the report. Thank you. Thank you, Zioka. Uh, I'm aware of that. I was part of it. ITDP was part of it. So in our discussions with uh, Namata, we bring the concerns of that inclusivity into place. And I can assure you that they've been taken on board and they are continually reviewed as we look at designs. Thank you. Good. I was about to invite Benson Jenga, the director of the Urban Development Department, to close this session. And I was going to say that from UN Habitat perspective, these conversations are ongoing. We have been on board on this public transport conversation for long in Nairobi alongside ITDP and people-centered public transport is what we'd like to speak about. We've planned for the cars for very long. Now we need to review how people can move from one place to the other. Access through NMT, cycling, the BRT projects, and hopefully what Simon has shared good bankable projects that will attract development partners that will give coherence in Nairobi is what we need to look into. I'm aware infrastructure bonds are being considered by counties. So this is not a foreign concept dropping out here. And let's engage broadly. Let's allow ourselves to move to the Council of Governors also with this agenda so that other secondary cities can actually be the places Nairobi benchmarks to. That for me is feasible and it is possible. I uh, have appreciated moderating the session. Thank you ITDP for co-creating this session with me and for helping me in managing it. Thank you participants for being there, for being optimistic about our cities in the region it shall come to pass. One day, we shall see a bit of London in Nairobi, in Nakuru, in Eldoret, and in Kisumu. Namata, thank you again for availing us the platform to do this. So without further talking, engineer Jenga, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rahab. Uh, let me start by introducing myself. My name is engineer Benjamin Jenga. I'm the Secretary of Urban and Metropolitan Development in the State Department for Housing and Urban Development. I know our ministry is very wrong, Ministry of uh, Transport, Infrastructure, Housing, Urban Development, and Public Works. Uh, I was studying for the PS uh, in terms of giving the closing remarks. However, let me also say that uh, I'm a board member of NAMATA. And I know during the discussion, uh, I was able to capture quite a number of concerns that were aired by members, light from Lahab, uh, my good friend Solomon, uh, my good friend Engineer Kideda, and the concern was uh, where is Namata and what is Namata doing? Uh, as uh, the other speakers from Namata have just said, 
no matter we are on the right track, is only that we are quite young. We are crawling. And I know if uh, Kideda can be honest in his discussions, uh, when he was the, the DG Kenha, and when they were starting, I know they also started the way we are starting. So let me assure members at all as well, we are on the right track. And uh, sooner than later, we will be there and everybody will be proud of Namata. Uh, we need now to be enabled by the government and I know the government is doing well. Uh, I know you're not going to talk about uh, what we are doing in terms of being enabled by Namata, but uh, the government through SCAC, uh, we, we are really seeing how we can get uh, staff within Namata. I know most of the staff that are in Namata are being seconded, uh, including our own DG. Uh, he is uh, the Secretary of Infrastructure. I think almost all the senior members in Namata are being seconded, but we are working closely to see how we can have staff of our own. So as we talk, I wanted to give that assurance that all is well, and uh, sooner than later, you'll be able to get uh, uh, Namata being in the right position. Uh, let me apologize for the, the PS. Uh, he's out of the country, and uh, he really, really wanted to be uh, the one crossing this uh, workshop that has been there for the last three days. Uh, however, in our discussions yesterday, uh, he, myself, uh, and the, the DG, uh, we agreed I can come in and uh, cross, and I'm proud to do so. However, before we do the, the final crossing, uh, let me say that uh, Nairobi metropolitan area that is made up of Nairobi, Kajiado, Machakos, Kiambu, and Muranga, is really experiencing a very high population growth rate and rapid increase in the private vehicle ownership. Uh, this is really resulting to urban sprawl and uh, unbearable traffic uh, jams. And in effect, it is making it quite difficult to move in and about the city. You know, sometimes uh, when you are along the major roads in the city, sometimes if you are being driven, you may opt to walk and you leave your car. Because sometimes it may take a, a longer time to walk 100 meters, uh, to, to, to drive 100 meters than walking. And this is really, really as a result of uh, many uh, private vehicles being owned up. Apart from the unacceptable delays in traffic uh, jams, the congestion has really resulted in deteriorating of air quality. Uh, the issue of uh, the, the carbon uh, being released to the, to the environment is uh, at a very alarming rate. A uh, very uh, high road uh, safety concerns and also reduced access to social and economic opportunities within and around the city. This is something that we are taking with a lot of concern, not only within the matter, but also within the ministry. I think it is quite well known that about 80% of our Kenyan urban population either walk or use public transport to their daily, uh, day, day, day chores. However, it is also noted that most of our roads do not have adequate facilities for these modes. These result in poor working environment and unsatisfactory public transport services. In this regard, and as a result of the emerging uh, city uh, transport challenges, Namata has commenced the implementation of the proposed uh, BRT uh, within Nairobi metropolitan area. And I know this must have been reported by one of our own Prana engineer, Prana Maina. The mandate of Namata is to oversee establishment of in, an integrated, efficient, safe, reliable, and sustainable transport system within Nairobi metropolitan area. As I said, that is uh, made up of Nairobi City, Kiambu, Kajiado, Machakos, and Muranga. As our members have said, and I think this was also said quite uh, at length by Solomon, we have identified five BRT corridors for implementation for uh, mass rapid transit, with planning and design being underway. However, Namata has identified the Dika Road BRT Line 2 as a pilot for the BRT implementation. In this regard, I'm very pleased to indicate that the government of Kenya has put a budget of 5.5 billion Kenya shillings for the development of infrastructure 
and uh, it is going on. Of course, I saw quite a number of concerns that uh, members in this uh, workshop were raising uh, the conflict between uh, the, the construction and the other road users. However, as Solomon indicated, there will be a need for the private sector involvement in terms of financing the loading stock. So the infrastructure will be owned by the government uh, through Namata, but there will be a need for us now to involve the private, uh, the private sector in terms of uh, building the buses. I know within uh, Namata, we have had uh, discussions. As late as yesterday, we had a discussion with the PSA Energy because we need also to have to bring in some rolling stocks uh, for the pilot system. And our, our thoughts is that we need to, to bring buses that are electric driven, not the diesel driven. So this is a discussion that is going on. And uh, when we are at advanced stage, I know we'll be able to share that. The development of a high quality BRT system requires that several components are planned in an integrated manner. A vital element of this process is the service plan that identifies the most efficient way to deploy the bus fleet to serve existing passenger demand. The operational parameters determined through the service plan help to help define infrastructure elements and bus fleet needed to meet expected demand levels. Uh, Namata, I'm proud to say, in, uh, in partnership with ITDP, uh, conducted a citywide public transport study in 2018-2019 to, uh, uh, to assess the demand for public transport in Nairobi. Based on the findings of the survey, Namata was able to establish public transport demand on major public transport corridors. And uh, subsequently, the ministry has also partnered with ITDP to develop still street design manual for urban areas in Kenya, uh, which is also now at advanced stage. I'm also happy to learn that uh, this training webinar, uh, whose objective was to develop a BR, BRT training and design capacity and evaluate uh, existing and planned BRT system in the region, has uh, been very successful. At uh, the last two days, I was not able to join, but I joined uh, at around 11 in the morning today, and I was able to follow from the presentation from Kigali. Uh, however, when the, the presenter was starting, we had some challenges, but uh, later on he came in. And those are the, uh, the good practice that we need also to implement in Nairobi. I know Kigali came after Nairobi, but they are quite advanced. Uh, we were able to discuss about the uh, BRT design framework and service planning for Nairobi BRT. Uh, I'm happy that uh, the, the, the meeting was also taken through the BRT planning for Addis Ababa. Cairo, and uh, the, the many discussions that were also discussed about Nairobi. I think it was quite interesting to get one of us presenting about the challenges that we get along the Moor Road when we are walking, the challenges that we get uh, at the upper hill. I think it was done by Penina. It was quite good for us now to have the reality on where we are. And I'm also happy that uh, Pranamaina also indicated the challenges that we have in terms of uh, uh, the rating that the taxation in terms of our uh, rates. Uh, the issue of having USV uh, and the site value that we are not able to capture the rad value capture. So the rating still remains the same whether you've developed or not developed. And we are not able, we are not able now to, to increase the taxation. Thereby, we are not able now to enhance the capacity for the service that we need to give uh, the people that are really affected by the people who are developing. The participants were also taken through the experiences and challenges experienced in Dalisaram. I know one time, maybe Solomon may not remember, uh, when I was in Seteho, we were, we were taken through the BRT system in Dalisaram. And that time, uh, uh, that time, uh, Solomon was working with the old bank in Dalisaram. And at that time, uh, the BRT system in Delhi Saram was, I think, at design stage. It's quite uh, challenging to know that uh, we were left behind and Delhi Saram, they are quite ahead. Uh, this is an issue that uh, not only for us in a matter, but uh, everybody who is putting uh, a stake, we need not to, uh, to see and how we can also move uh, with, a, with a higher speed. Uh, we really appreciate uh, what we saw there, Solomon. 
uh, those many years ago, I think it's more than 10 years ago, uh, when uh, you, are, you are really able to take us through the, the concept of the BRT system in the Risaram. Uh, the discussions further covered the industry transition and TOD. As I finish, I want to take this opportunity to thank the participants. I know the participants were quite a number. Uh, some keep on uh, coming, some keep on dropping. And I know we were more than 175 cumulatively uh, being drawn from Morocco and international participation. I think this is quite good. I want to thank uh, our Namata, ITDP, and UN Habitat uh, for the role they played in this workshop. I think this has been a very good opportunity for us to share experiences. And I believe participants have learned uh, good practices across the, the region. And uh, I know they'll be able to discuss further within the organizations to see how we can improve. And we should start more from where we are and uh, go upwards. I know the government through a ministry will borrow from the workshop outcomes to enhance the planning and implementation of DRT infrastructure. And I believe uh, ITDP will be able to share the workshop report so that as we discuss within uh, the, board of Na, the, the, the board of Namata, uh, and uh, we have scaled to the, our, our CS, we'll be able now to be informed by the workshop report. Uh, finally, I want to ensure I saw one comment that uh, there will be a need for Namata to keep on engaging. And I want to assure members that uh, Namata will keep on engaging with you, with UN Habitat, ID, uh, ITDP, and other stakeholders like Kura and NMS. Sometimes we have uh, gaps in terms of uh, the engagement. And when the gaps come uh, from the stakeholders, the people that suffer are the, the public. And the, the issue for us to engage with other stakeholders is to ensure that the public get a good environment for those who are working and for those who are having uh, the public transport. With that, I want to wish everybody a very good afternoon, a very good weekend and happy Labor Day. And with that, I want to declare the workshop officially closed. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much, Engineer Jenga. Engineer Jenga, incidentally, was uh, my classmate in the university. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, you Nancy. For joining us. Uh, Rehab has lost her connection. So uh, I want to invite Carol to tell us uh, where to get uh, all the information, all the, the uh, presentations. Carol? Um, yes, so everything, including the recordings and the PPTs are on the website. Um, so we haven't uploaded today's presentations yet, but they should be there in an hour or so. Okay, so thank I'm going you. To send an email. I'm going to send an email to all the participants so they should have everything. Okay, thank you very much, Carol. So we are going to respond to all the questions and we will share with all the participants uh, uh, the answers or the comments. So thank you very, very much, everybody, for finding time to attend uh, this webinar. Uh, we appreciate, we know uh, it's not easy for people to stay on for so many hours. There are people who kept coming back. We do appreciate local and international participants. Uh, that was very uh, impressive. So thank you very much. We'll keep uh, organizing similar uh, webinars and we'll let you know when the next one will be. Thank you very much and may God bless you. And keep safe.